Good evening. We just called the meeting to order. Sam's going to call the roll. Alexander? Here. Alexander. Kelly? Present. Tina? Present. Ms. Patterson? Here. Ms. Grant? Here. Mr. Valtero is here. Mr. Wagner? Here. We have four can I get a motion to retire to executive session? So moved. Second. You got to read all your stuff. Litigation when in action against affecting or on behalf of a particular public body has been filed, filed and is pending before a court or administrative tribunal, or when the public body finds that an action is probable or imminent, in which case the basis for the finding shall be recorded and entered into the minutes of the closed meeting, 5 ILCS 122 C11. The appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees, specific individuals, or who serve as independent contractors in a park, recreational, educational setting, or specific volunteers of a public body, or legal counsel for a public body, including hearing testimony on a complaint lodged against an employee, a specific individual who serves as an independent contractor in a park recreation education setting or volunteer of a public body or against legal counsel for the public body to determine its validity. However, a meeting to consider an increase in compensation to a specific employee or public body that is subject to local government wage increase transparency act may not be closed and shall be open to the public and posted and held in accordance with the with this act by ILCS 122C1, collective negotiating matters between the public body and its employees or their representatives or deliberation concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees. 5 ILCS 122C2. Mr. Valterez, please call the roll. Ms. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Alexander? Aye. Ms. Medina? Aye. Ms. Patterson? Aye. Mr. Rivera is aye. Ms. Grant? Aye. Mr. Wagner? Aye. Motion carried. We are in executive session at 543.
Now reconvene the regular meeting. Can I get a motion to reconvene the regular meeting of Proviso Township High School so Board of Education? So moved. Second. Mr. Beltay, please follow the roll. Ms. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Medina? Aye. Ms. Patterson? Aye. Ms. Grant? Aye. Mr. Valtier is aye. Ms. Wagner? Aye. Mr. Alexander? and excellence and providing equitable education opportunities to empower each student 
Our graduates are prepared for college careers and to serve as contributing members of a dynamic global society. Good evening, board president, vice president, board secretary, board members, community, faculty, and staff. Good evening. Um, we will get started uh, with our PowerPoint presentation. Get started with our academics division first. We are absolutely excited about the work we are doing in this district, and uh, look forward to you hearing uh, from us, Dr. Williams. Good evening, Board President Patterson, Vice President Kelly, Board Secretary Dante Harris, Board Members, and Dr. Henderson. I'm Sharon Williams, the Deputy Superintendent of Schools. And we have a few updates for you this um, evening regarding the summer data snapshot, um, updates on summer learning, and next steps around students' rights and responsibilities. So the first data set that we'd like to share with you um, has to do with attendance. And I'd like to bring our attention back to the categories by which we are uh, judged or held accountable for the Illinois report card. Uh, one big slice of this is chronic absenteeism. So we'll talk a little bit tonight about where we are in terms of our absenteeism rates in the district and plans to improve those um, statistics. So I like to frame this as maximizing learning time. We know when scholars are not in school, they are not learning. And we need to ma maximize the entire school day and the entire school year to make sure that our scholars are learning. We also want to emphasize throughout this presentation that there's a collective responsibility that includes our scholars, our teachers, our families, and uh, our school leaders around improving where we are now. So we know that poor attendance affects scholars in many ways, including not only lowering their test scores, <coughs> keeping them away from their goals in terms of graduation and their next steps, but they also feel out of place when they're out of school many days of the year. They miss important opportunities and deadlines that go along with their high school career. Uh, they begin to develop low grades, low test scores, and as you'll see from some of our summer school data, there are many students who are in credit recovery now, um, primarily to failing courses and not doing well. So we want to make sure that scholars are in class on time every day and uh, stay the entire day and miss very few days per school year. So chronic absenteeism, as defined by our state, and, and that accounts for 10% of the ISBE report card, means that students are absent 10% or more of school days in the, uh, the most recent academic school year. So that means with a school year of 176 days, that could mean that a student misses up to 17 or more days in that school year. That's how our state defines chronic absenteeism. Now, ISBE has reported uh, for the past four years, these are our chronic absenteeism rates for our school district. You see the big spike for the year that we were most highly impacted by the uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, we're back at uh, this past school year at about 25.90% of our students who are defined as chronically absent from school. And that mirrors uh, the data from 2018, uh, lowered just a little bit from that, uh, the lowest rate that the district has had. Moving to chronic truancy, so this is defined as students missing 5% or more days um, in this past school year, as we is only reporting this one year of data for us. As you can see, this is quite high and above the state average of 22.80% of students missing 5% or more days. Uh, this is one of those indicators that we're going to pay very close attention to uh, next year so that we can begin to address students before they get to the point where they're chronically truant or cr chronically absent from school. So again, this is about uh, collective responsibility. Everyone has a part in ensuring that our students are at school and on time and stay the entire day and that includes our scholars, our families, teachers, and school leaders. So with the um, 
this coming school year, uh, Dr. Carvalis has begun to outline some very clear expectations for school leaders, for teachers, for scholars around how we will account for students every day in school and putting in very uh, stringent procedures at the school level to make sure that we are capturing students before they become chronically truant and chronically absent from school. Is that going to be um, communicated with Power School as well? Because we have an issue with how Power School reports out. Yes, we're currently working very closely with Power School and um, actually are adding in a component to Power School called Power Pack, which allows for an early warning system that allows us to have better, clearer data as soon as we log on to Power School for us to see as school leaders and teachers uh, where we are on any given day in the district regarding that. Uh, we'll also take a look at notification of parents and that is part of the procedure that we're putting together now. So as I mentioned, this is a collective responsibility. Uh, we do expect our scholars to be present on time every day for all classes. Um, you'll notice in some of our discipline data that cutting class is one of the top five incidents that we report in our schools. So it's important for us, for our scholars to be in school and in all classes all day. Uh, we want our family support and need our family support to ensure that their scholars are on time and present all day, every day for all classes. And our teachers are on the front line of this, making sure that our record keeping is done well, that we are ensuring that we are keeping up with students and when we notice that a student is absent or not in our class that we're reporting that and making sure that we have a plan for recapturing those students back into our classrooms and then finally our leaders set the vision for this they set high expectations will set high expectations for attendance they're going to set goals around attendance rates they're going to monitor and report that data frequently and they'll set and support those internal procedures based on the district guidance around attendance. So in another category of maximizing our learning time, that includes scholar discipline and how we uh, plan to ensure that we are lessening our use of exclusionary practices in our school district to keep students in class and learning. So in May, we shared a brief snapshot of where we were regarding discipline. This is school year end data regarding discipline referrals. And this chart and the pie graph indicate the number, total number of referrals at each of our three schools and the percentage of referrals uh, based on each school. With a district total of nearly 2,500 referrals in the past school year. Now, the next several slides are going to break down reported incidents and reported consequences at each of our school. We've taken a look at the top five incidents and top five consequences that are meted out to students over the course of the year. And this is a three-year look at our data. If you see missing data for 2021, that's a, as a result of the uh, COVID pandemic. And there was uh, little or zero um, amounts in those areas. So this, the first couple of slides is for Proviso Math and Science Academy. And that's a reported incidents. And then the reported consequences for PMSA. The next several slides is the data for East High School. The first slide is for reported incidents. Second is for reported consequences. Mr. Swanson, do we have a power report? We're good. Okay. Provides a West High School reported incidents and reported consequences. For your consideration this evening as an action item, the State of Illinois Board of Education is requiring uh, school districts who have are in the top 20% of schools in terms of ex exclusionary practices. Proviso Township High Schools District was 
um, indicated for the rate of suspensions of students. And this is the three-year data regarding uh, the percentage of students who were suspended from our schools in 2018, 19, and 20. We're also indicated for one year of data uh, regarding disproportionality in exclusionary practices, and that was in 2018. Um, we are required to uh, submit a discipline implement, uh, improvement plan based on our um, status in the top 20% of schools in the state for suspensions. So this is a snapshot of the collective responsibility as a theme, and you'll also have, we have further recommendations later on in the presentation regarding how we're going to improve behavior and discipline in the school district. And again, uh, we want to emphasize that scholars, families, teachers, and leaders are all going to be a part of the solution to make sure that we are improving behavior and discipline in our schools. Yes. Did this mean with this report that we're going to actually now have an attendance policy and a discipline policy that's going to be district-wide implemented and reported on parents? Yes. So that's one of the biggest issues that we have is that we do not have a consistent <laughs> attendance policy. We do not have a consistent discipline policy. Parents don't know if the child's been suspended, when they can return. I've gotten numerous calls throughout the year. They don't know when their kid can return, if they can return. They don't know what to do. There's no delineation. Yes, so later on in our presentation, we're going to outline our plan for a student's rights and responsibilities handbook that's going to augment what we've done in terms of the student handbook and a communication plan around that. And that includes many uh, webinars and in-person uh, meetings to make sure that we all um, are calibrated around the students' rights and responsibilities and how we're going to make sure that everyone knows the expectations of the school district. So one of the two big Excuse me for a second. Board yes. members, if we can wait until uh, the report is complete, write our questions down and then present them so that we don't start and stop. Please. Thank you. So uh, uh, two of the uh, highest priority initiatives for us next year is to ensure that our students are in a safe and responsive uh, classroom and school. Uh, so restorative practices and professional development around restorative practices will be put, put in place. What we're proposing is that we start with our school leaders, our counselors, our social workers, those who would most often um, have contact with students when they have behavioral difficulties. We'd also like to engage a cohort of teachers, security um, officials, and support staff who would be in the first cohort of um, individuals who are closest to the students to begin to learn about restorative practices and be the uh, way makers, the leaders in that area in their schools and across the district. We'd also like to reimagine in-school suspension, and we're going to rename that those reset rooms. And the purpose of reset rooms is just that. We're going to um, begin reteaching behavioral expectations to students. We're going to check in with them around their social emotional state, and we're also going to get them back on track so that they can return to their classroom. In-school suspension is another type of exclusionary practice when students are not in front of their teacher. That means that they are being excluded from instruction, and the best place for them to be is in the classroom. Uh, so these reset rooms will be established at each school, and as mentioned, will replace the moniker of ISS and be more restorative in nature. We're also going to ensure that we have a good grounding and understanding of social emotional learning uh, as part of our discipline improvement plan and a, an initiative through ISBE partnering with Loyola um, and this empathic instruction deals with teachers being more empathetic toward our students understanding their points of views and their social emotional status in order to make sure that their classrooms are places um, that students can thrive. We'll also employ um, SEL student surveys 
so that we can understand better the landscape of social emotional learning in our schools and also incorporate um, social emotional uh, assemblies and lessons in our classroom so that we can uh, support students in their social emotional states. Along the same line as maximizing learning time, we are partnering with West 40 for our Alternative Learning Opportunities Program, ALOC, and I'd like to present a few data points for our partnership with West 40. So West 40 is, uh, partners with us on three primary programs, the first of which is DREAM. DREAM is for students who are undercredited and need um, additional assistance to make sure that they're catching up with their credits. Uh, both East and West have uh, DREAM programs, and as you can see, they serve about 188 and 190 students, so about 190 at each school. Uh, West 40 reported um, they have a very strong parent and family outreach program that goes along with DREAM. They've reported over a thousand, I can't see it on my screen, about a thousand, <laughs> thank you, I can't see that far, obviously. So their end of the year data we've reported, um, again, they work with students who are undercredited, and they have reported this year at East that um, of the 188 scholars that they're serving, that those scholars have uh, earned approximately 674 credits back that they were missing, and at West, of the 191 students attending, about 564 credits. They also attribute 66 graduates from the East program and 21 graduates at the West program. The graph at the bottom represents um, information that West 40 provided around setting goals. So they set goals with their um, scholars who are in both programs. And as you can see, um, the percentage here, this is a percentage of students who met those goals around academic, social, emotional, and attendance in the program. There's somewhat of a gap between East and West, so we're going to work with our West 40 partners to make sure that our students are meeting their goals that they set. The other two programs that we partner with West 40 and the ALUT program are Proviso Peace and Proviso Seniors Plus. Peace is a program that works with students that experience behavioral difficulties. And those students who may be um, excluded or going to be excluded from school, this didn't advance the slide. So Proviso Peace, again, is our program that we partner with them regarding students with behavioral difficulties and at risk of uh, being excluded from school. And as you can see, there are about 43 students in that program and uh, six graduates from that program this year and about 121 credits earned. The Seniors Plus program works with um, students who are in their fifth or higher year of high school in order to get them across the graduation uh, stage. And uh, we have 71 students in that program. 24 graduates are attributed to that program with 180 or so credits earned. 
In addition to our partnership with West 40 for the ALOP program, our district is going to sponsor an evening school this coming school year. And the goal of that evening school is to decrease the number of students who disengage with school. And that could be students who are experiencing difficulty keeping up with their credits, but also students who are experiencing behavioral difficulties in school. We've also heard from many students that the regular school day doesn't um, always fit things in their personal life, such as work and family obligations. So we're going to make sure that all students are engaged in some way in school in an evening uh, setting. Uh, our grand opening of evening school will be September 12th, 2022. We'll be putting more um, meat on the frame of evening school and be able to share more details with you and um, our school community later. Uh, our goal is to have supportive small group settings for students uh, to keep them engaged in school. We're going to collaborate with social workers and other um, um, mental health professionals to ensure that students have support. The goal will be to help them set and monitor their own goals and develop a success plan for scholars. We know that they have many different needs, so we want to prescribe a program that's going to keep them engaged in school and keep them moving toward graduation. The next um, set of information has to do with summer learning, and we put these uh, in three categories. That includes the summer flight, summer um, school program highlights, uh, leadership learning, including the leadership retreat, and then also um, some information about teacher professional development happening this summer. So first I'd like to highlight uh, what's going on in summer flight right now. And uh, we started back as soon as school was out in June. The first session ends today <coughs> and the ended today and the next session starts again tomorrow. Currently we have 698 students enrolled in credit recovery. 130 students um, enrolled in accelerated math in the math and science academies programs. And as of uh, today, this first session, 375 courses have been completed by our scholars in this first summer session. That is a credit to our coordinator of um, summer flight, Dr. B Bessie Carvalis. Also, teacher leaders that stepped up to the plate to help organized summer flight in our school leaders and teachers. The second slide highlights um, our enrichment programs. And what I would like to say and point out that our goal is to lower these numbers for credit recovery and increase the numbers of students in enrichment programs. We have had, uh, we have three enrichment programs running this summer. Uh, that includes freshman connection for those incoming ninth graders an upward bound program and also museum tours. And students have been engaged in STEM activities. Uh, they have been to uh, several um, high quality first class museums in our area and have learned a lot in integrating their learning with STEM. So we'd like to increase those numbers next year, decrease the number of students needing credit recovery courses and increase the opportunities for students to have enrichment during the summer. So just as a reminder, this is our summer flight timeline. Our second session begins tomorrow and ends August 2nd, and summer commencement is August 4th here at uh, PMSA at 6 o'clock p.m. The second highlight for summer learning is our leadership retreat, which was held June 29th through July 1st. And that included all of our school leaders and also the educational services team. We focused in on two of the strategic goals of the district, goal number one and goal number two, and that's building a culture of continuous improvement and design equitable systems for school-based and district-wide improvement. And then the second objective, all students will have access to and engagement with high quality, equitable, and relevant instruction. So the goals of the retreat were first to build teamwork. We have many new members. We wanted to make sure that we started our summer planning for next school year as a strong team and establish team norms. 
Uh, we, uh, with the help of Mr. Gleason, deepened our understanding of the collective bargaining agreement. We also held our first data roundtable. This is where school teams presented data in all areas, including attendance, discipline, um, and PSAT, SAT results uh, with, to their peers and got input and feedback from the entire team. Uh, we'll hold uh, data roundtables, as it says, quarterly. So the next round will be near November after we have a couple of sets of data at the beginning of the school year. We're also seeking to reestablish our professional learning communities with a focus on teacher-led uh, collaboration in schools. And we also started on a journey of looking at ourselves regarding our equity stance and how we're going to ensure equity in our schools. The second part of um, developing leaders in the summer is our School Leadership Institute. So the leadership retreat is more conceptual, team building, overall team norms. The School Leadership Institute will hone in on technical skills of the schools and working on procedures across the board. So again, focusing on goal one and two of the strategic plan. Um, our operations partners will be a part of the School Leadership Institute to ensure that we're um, developing standards for operational excellence at all of our schools. We're going to focus in on our diverse learners, that includes students with disabilities and English learners. Uh, we're also going to focus in on those things that school leaders should be doing every day to make sure that our scholars are successful. And we're going to hone in on the students' rights and responsibilities uh, discussion there. We also are going to um, make sure that we all understand the procedures regarding referring students to our ALOP programs, discipline expectations and procedures, so acting as one district regarding our discipline and behavioral expectations of students. Uh, we're going to take a deep dive into our SAT, PSAT, and AP data. We have a partner from the College Board coming to uh, work with us on that. And we're also going to start on two documents that will guide the work of school teams next year. And that's a continuous improvement plan, otherwise known as a school improvement plan. Uh, they will basically finish and have a very good um, final draft ready at the end of those four days and also what we're calling a school playbook, and that helps schools opera operationalize the policy and procedures of the district, and basically it's the way the school is going to do things. So for instance, their lunch procedures, their arrival, dismissal procedures, how they're going to um, handle things internally at their schools based on guidance from the district. So later in the summer, after our, our summer school, our summer flight sessions are over, we're going to focus in on a few key um, elements of teacher professional development, including uh, performance matters, which will replace Mastery Connect this coming school year. We're going to ensure that our teachers are well versed in using that platform in order to track student data. We're going to um, begin our first cohort for restorative practices and focusing in on social emotional learning, uh, share any curriculum updates with teachers, and then our, on our district institute days right before school starts, we're going to make sure that our content area teachers are able to meet with each other and learn together as a group. We're going to focus in on some key instructional practices that we're going to um, work on this year this coming year, and then also um, emphasize the students' rights and responsibilities with teachers in that forum. So next is um, some of the ways we're planning for a successful school year next year. And this is what um, a few things that mirror back to some of the data sets that we talked about. So the Students' Rights and Responsibilities Handbook is, is the student handbook just with a new name. This will provide a framework for the academic and positive behavior uh, standards that we have for students. Um, it explains the expectation, rights, and responsibility for all members of the school community. Again, a collective responsibility from students, families, teachers, and leaders. And also creates a structure where we are partnering 
um, and building strong relationships with um, everyone in our school community. So along that line, we're going to outline in the Students' Rights and Responsibilities Handbook the expectations that we have for each of our um, stakeholders, how we want to communicate and communicate well the students' rights and responsibilities, and then how we're going to ensure accountability for everyone. So I want to start with electronic devices and cell phones. So a few um, high, um, high priorities for us is to ensure that we have a learning environment that's conducive to learning. Uh, one issue has been the use of cell phones, and we want to ensure uniformity and consistency across all three campuses regarding the use of cell phones and electronic devices. So on the next slide, we're going to just outline some of the highlights of the Board of Education's policy regarding cell phone usage and a strong portion of our Students' Rights and Responsibilities Communication Plan is to start early with all of, all of uh, the folks that are responsible for this to make sure that we have shared understanding of how we're going to ensure accountability next year regarding cell phones. So in the current board policy, students can use phones during lunch. They can use them for educational purposes under the guidance, and I'd say close guidance, of their teacher, use phones in emergency situations, and possess them as long as they are powered off and out of sight during the regular school day. Students cannot use phones or electronic devices to violate the rights of others. That includes taking photos of others in locker rooms or bathrooms, um, to cheat, or to create, send, share, view, receive or possess indecent visual depictions, and that includes fights. And the asterisk there is a very strong statement regarding the responsibility of principals, and that is the principal has the right to ban cell phones. Another topic that we want to be sure that we communicate well and early is our district dress code. Uh, so we are going to address that very clearly in the Students' Rights and Responsibilities Handbook, and we're going to communicate well and early and often regarding our dress code. We want to, again, ensure that we're um, being fair and that we're being consistent across all three campuses about how we're going to uh, regard students and teachers around a dress code. Can you speak briefly to... Um our proposal as to what we will be bringing to the board next month. Yes, so we will um, have a draft draft for your consideration regarding a dress code policy that the board can adopt. Is there anything else you'd like to add about that? Okay. What does that include? Hmm? What does that include? A dress code that for, for the district, okay. for students. Is it a uniform? No, it is not a uniform form. Just some specific guidelines. That's all. We'll bring that next month. Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Williams. So the communication plan, as I mentioned, we want to communicate early, often, frequently, uh -oh, regarding um, how we're going to regard students in, in terms of everything in the Students' Rights and Responsibilities Handbook, but especially those um, issues that are uh, top of mind. So we're going to over communicate to the uh, best of our ability and that includes robocalls and texts. We have webinars coming up and I'll have a slide with dates already set and times for that. We're going to make sure that we're emailing using our social media, a website, and also orientation times for schools to engage um, scholars, families, and teachers around the students' rights and responsibilities. So a few updates as well regarding community and family engagement. Our Parents on Patrol um, initiative will be back in effect in the fall. And we want to invite parents and other family members to be a part of that uh, Parents on Patrol. Uh, Dr. Henderson will convene his employee advisories throughout the school year. 
we're also going to, as a way to welcome back scholars to school, um, scholars and families, and to outline some of those expectations, we'll have two town hall meetings, a ninth and 10th grade town hall meeting on August 11th from 6 to 8 p.m., and then 11th and 12th grade town hall on August 17th from 6 to 8 p.m. Excuse me, in go back to that. Yeah. In addition to the uh, employees advisory, we'll also have our parents advisory. We will resume our parent advisory as well. Thank you. These are the dates and times for the webinars for the students' rights and responsibilities. Uh, we'll start on August 10th and have dates each week leading up to the beginning of school at various times so that uh, students, family members, et cetera, can join at a variety of times that meets with their schedule. There are several action items for your consideration this evening in the Educational Services Department. The first is the College Board Suite of Assessments proposal. Um, the second is the intergovernmental agreement with West 40 to partner with us around our ALOC programs. And finally, the ISBE Discipline Improvement Plan. So the first of, of the uh, action items is the College Board Suite of Assessments. We're, um, proposing to make an investment of about $40,000 in order to administer the PSAT, uh, the practice test in October. Uh, this data helps us understand better how our students are doing and how they will perform on the SAT and the PSAT in the spring. Um, it also gives us information regarding how scholars um, perform around AP and what their potential is to take accelerated placement tests uh, it comes with an SAT question bank that will help us um, inform our instructional practice in the classroom. It also links directly to the official SAT practice in Khan Academy, and it also gives a, our scholars an opportunity and connections to scholarships based on their scores. The second action item is the West 40 Intergovernmental Agreement, and again, they partner with us for our um, ALOT programs. The approximate investment by the district is about $48,000, and that's for transportation support for some of our scholars, also materials and supplies that they need in those uh, programs. And finally, the ISB Require Plan, that's the Discipline Improvement Plan. Again, we've been identified for being in the top 20% of schools in state regarding exclusionary practices, and it, this is a uh, required to be submitted to the Board of Education, approved and placed on our district website and submitted to ISBE. And that concludes our presentation. Do you have questions, Claudia? I have several. <coughs> Are we going to fix the account with the, an attendance policy? aligned with this? Is there going to be an attendance policy? You haven't mentioned that. Yes. So the you said that there's going to be student rights, but is there going to be a clear attendance policy for teachers and students to know and a follow? Board adopted policy? Mm -hmm. So I I'm, I'm not aware that there is or there's not a board attendance policy. We don't have an attendance policy. No, we don't have policy seven seventy deals with attendance and truancy. We do have a board policy for attendance and truancy. And I think you're asking, what, what's yeah, your I'm question, Claudia? Really, the policy is in regards to how to follow things so that there's a consistent format for follow through. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right now, one of the biggest issues that we have is that power school reports to parents period by period. So you can get four phone calls um, in regards to attendance. But, and then the child, you don't know if they're actually absent, if they're not absent. You don't know how to call to say that if they were five minutes late, if they weren't. Many times the kids are there. Um, and there's no way to report period by period to rectify that. So the cumulative um, issue that many of the students have is that it looks like they were absent for many days. But maybe they were, they were absent for five minutes. So 
if we could align power school with a clear attendance policy so that the students are clear if it's this period, if it's this many days, that they don't know. <coughs> There's no way of quantifying. Dr. And Williams, following you did on. speak to that. Uh, she's describing procedures. Yes. yes. And you did speak to that. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, ma'am. I'm finished. I have quite a few. Restorative practices. In, in regards to restorative practices, generally speaking, when um, restorative justice is implemented in the school, there's usually a homework. There's a time where the, there's, a, there's a touch base with the students so that you can actually have um, time to work with the students to develop those SEL um, guidelines and relationships. They have, a touch, they have a touch base, somebody that they touch base with, oftentimes um, it was the deans that the students worked with on a consistent basis, but we don't have deans anymore. The deans were the only ones that were trained fully in restorative practices. And with the fact that we don't have any deans, how are we going to actually relate these restorative practices with the students? Who's going to be the person that they actually connect and they start to have the relationship? Because without the establishment of a relationship, the restorative practices are not effective. Thank you for that. Any other questions, Ms. No, I'm asking. Uh, me, any other questions? I'm at, yes, uh, I, I have there, more. Uh, there's not a question, but uh, Ms. Medina, let's be clear. There's a difference between restorative justice and restorative practice. Restorative justice is normally used in the judicial system, unlike, mm, no. but, mm, yeah. They, they perhaps, but in schools. No, it's not perhaps. That's the case. In, in schools, the restorative justice. Okay, but the way that it's, we, it's we right. use restorative practice here. These kids not. are not in the juvenile detention center. Uh, they're not no. incarcerated. Um, no. Um, and I think you did. You spoke to that. You could go on to your next question. I don't want us to be confused about practice and justice. No, I'm talking about relationship. You can go to your next question. I'm not question. talking about relationship. I'm talking about Would you like to go to your next question, or are you done? No, I'm not done. Okay, go ahead. But I'm just correcting. I'm not talking about justice. We're, we're getting ready to move on. Teachers, um, it seems that um, there's a, there are several instructional needs. Because in some of the slides that you were talking about, you were saying that teachers uh, need to be more empathetic, and that some of the instruction is going to go on that. And I would say that, is there going to also be an administrative response when there's a crisis so that the teachers can actually continue to have the instructional time? What's happening is there's a lot of discipline that has now been put on the, on the backs of the teachers. And um, it, it, it goes into the instructional time. And there, there needs to be more support from administration. So are we going to also work on how quickly our administration responds to issues that for our teachers? Absolutely. So our student rights and responsibilities uh, student handbook, per se, will outline um, how school leaders are responding to different incidents. Uh, so we're adding information about um, minor offenses, major offenses, <coughs> the ladder of um, progressive discipline, uh, so that we can have accountability from the scholar to the leader, um, and so that everyone is clear that this type of offense would um, render a consequence that's higher um, on the consequence ladder, and those that are minor can be dealt with in a variety of ways. The next question in regards to the evening school. Are accredited teachers going to be teaching the evening school? Absolutely, yes. Okay, you didn't mention anything about teachers. All, all teachers, teachers are certified. Claudia, Medina. All our teachers are certified. I've never known of this district to hire someone that wasn't certified to teach. That's not the question. I, I hear your but question loud and clear, but the accusation is though on, we've had people that this, were in that. That's not the question right. That's not true. The question arose because on the slide it was mentioned that there is going to be social workers, but there was no mention of teachers. So I wanted to see if we were also having, in the evening school, accredited teachers leading the program as well. That's the sure question. we're going to have students. I'm sure we're going to have teachers. I'm sure we're going to have social workers. I mean, it's, 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 it's the, the coordination of teachers okay. and Very social good. workers and other staff. It's it's an evening okay. school. Mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. um, what happened to the STEM school that we used to have at summer? Um, there's, there's STEM components of the enrichment programs. Okay, so the, the, the 
doesn't answer my question, but we used to have a, a, a full STEM program where the kids used to even develop products and things, and it was led by teachers in the district. Is there a chance that that could be returned? Because it was highly effective, the students absolutely loved it. And it was led by some of our amazing science teachers. We didn't offer that this, this whole round, Ms. Medina. I know, I'm, I'm asking if it could be brought back. You're asking for something that we didn't even offer this year. Your next right. question. School Improvement Grant, according to, uh, on the website for um, ISBE, we did not apply for that grant. We're in the process of planning for the application of that grant. The consolidated school uh, plan has to be approved by ISB before we can begin that grant application, and we have begun planning for that. Okay, it was due in January, so I'm just curious as to why I haven't been. No, we, we currently haven't approved. <coughs> Okay. Um, so, grant. so we're going, we're going the back. Next year's grant is in the approval, um, is in the completion stage now. Okay. Um, as far as the cell phones are concerned, could you could you explain further about the possibility that the principal would have a right to ban cell phones in schools? That's clearly defined in the Board of Education policy. That's our policy. Okay. Uh, parents on patrol. How many parents on patrol do we currently have, and how many are we seeking? We are seeking as many parents as we can find, and you can join us. Are we going to hire more security? We're going to and more or more adults field. in another in another so that to, to further assist with many of the issues that are happening in our home. Miss Medina, we're going to backfill. Of the, of the vacancies, yes. Is there a chance that we could have less part-time and more full-time to ensure that there's no gaps and we can make sure that our students are safe? There are several parents that are highly concerned about the safety of their students. We all are, thank you. Are we going to hire more? We're going to hire pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. And that number is 53. We will restaff to that number. Okay. Are there any other questions? Any other board members with questions? I want to ask uh, Amanda. Okay, thank you. Um, just kind of backing up to the maximizing learning time where you were talking about the Dream Peace and Seniors Plus program. There was a column in the chart, charts marked, I'm sorry. There was a column in the charts marked family outreach, and I was wondering if you could just explain that because I didn't hear what that was. Yes, so uh, within each of those programs, the uh, folks that work with West 40 and those programs reach out to families in a variety of ways. So they define it as um, home visits, phone calls, emails, any contact that they've had with that scholar's family. Okay, so, so I think they're counting um, each outreach as a separate incident of so like phone call, that's one. Email, that's one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, uh, and then another question I had is, have, has it been on anyone's radar what effect maybe starting later, the schooling day starting later, would have on attendance? Mm -hmm. there, there's pretty um, a rich research base yeah. Yeah. around teenagers and sleep and right. school start time. Right, and I know in some schools it, it seems still more of an experimental phase, but moving the school day to start later has had a positive impact on student attendance. I'm wondering if that has been in any discussions. Not, not as of yet, um, but certainly a consideration based on the research base around school start time for teenagers. Yeah, but in addition to that, we will be working with the union if we decide to move in that direction. Oh, right. I know it would it would require a whole bunch of changes. Yeah. But I know there has been just a, a big body of research about that affecting, you know, and if we're looking at such a high rate of chronic absenteeism, maybe we need to really think about Consider doing something that. radically different in how we structure our school day. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Rodney is going. Rodney? <clears throat> Oh, I have two quick questions. Uh, you said there were going to be two town hall meetings for parents. Yes. I was just wondering, are we going to have a parent university uh, this year? 
We briefly uh, talked about it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So you'll get back to us on it. Yes, we sure will. Thank you. Um, I would, I would just for, for the record, and I would highly advise against parent universities. They don't work. They have, they've never worked, and not since I've been before I was on the board. And you can't compel the parents to come, and they're not going to come. Um, but I that's up. That, I mean, that could be research. That's fine. That you can do. Um, with the slide on page three dealing with the chronic absenteeism uh, for 2021, was there any consideration given for the COVID pandemic that was still going on? I, I know we said we were looking at that, but we were still in the midst of a pandemic. So, how, are they attributing any of that absenteeism to the to the pandemic, or are we breaking that data down to? see what was responsible like, and then we're talking about medical conditions so how would they how would they weigh that as, as, a, as approved absences versus non-approved absences or still see problem yes and I, I think there's a combination of the both so with the students rights and responsibilities and the attendance procedure that we're putting together we can be more confident in the data that we're reporting to ISB. additionally ISB has uh, many statements and stars and um, call outs that this data has been impacted by the COVID pandemic. So they indicate that on their website as well as when they're reporting this data. Um, so twofold, improving our internal processes and procedures around attendance so that we're reporting correctly to ISB and accurately regarding student um, attendance. Um, but also ISBE is recognizing that the COVID pandemic had an impact on absentee, absenteeism and truancy. Um, last question, Madam President. Uh, board Policy 895, parent, or, I'm sorry, 895, parent involvement. Are we looking to include any of these items in the parent compact that according to board policy must be signed by every single parent <laughs> to hold them and the students accountable to the things that we're talking about. Telling them is one thing, but we have a policy that says that every parent must sign this compact and we can include all of those items that you just put in there. So now we have a written record of accountability for their responsibilities as it relates to the things that we're mentioning today. Short of that, um, yeah, we can have the seminars. They don't have to come. We can have the parent universities. They don't have to come. Or policy says that they must sign a compact. So I would hope that the administration would lean upon those teeth that we have to compel the parents and the students to sign either electronically. Uh, Mr. Johnson and I started that when he was here. You could register electronically and sign it that way or if they come in to register, making that a part of the registration process. Also, we're going to do a short five to ten minute webinar, seminar, make that a part of the registration process also. So that is a part of registration. They must complete this webinar or watch this movie before they are allowed to complete their registration, same if they come into the building to register. Slide over here, we have a five minute presentation for you that you must complete as a part of the registration. If we need to expand the policy, Board to do that, I'd say if we don't give the administration teeth to enforce these wonderful ideas, they will not get enforced. They will not get enforced. We've been doing this since I've been on the board. We've got to have something to hold parents and students accountable. When the parents or the principals have these meetings with the parents, they can pull out that parent contact and say, you signed that you would send your kid to school dressed properly. You signed that you would agree and work with us and have those cell phones off. Short of that, we're going to be playing this game. So we need to give the principals and the administration teeth this year. We have the policies. Let's work together to figure out a, an effective way to, to enforce them. Duly noted, Mr. President. No, 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 no. Say that. Say Mr. 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 I am the president. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have, um, Rodney, I hear what you're saying in reference to the uh, student handbook, if my mind serves me right, and I don't think it has changed too much, at registration that uh, student handbook is given to each student and that parent compact was normally taken out. The question is making sure 
that the signed agreement is put in each student's file. I know for a fact, for many years, it would sit in my office, and then afterwards, they would go to the garbage. Um, so I understand what you're saying about putting the teeth, and then just making sure that it, it happens. Um, one of the things I want to be, uh, I'm real passionate about, and I have to, we've had evening school improviso in the past. Um, as a former parent coordinator, what I don't want to happen is our expectant, expecting parent or parenting students are pushed over and housed in evening school. They are entitled to a free public education during the day, you know, if they can make it. Now, if there's a need that they may have to go there, yes, but I just want to make sure that that's not where they are going to be pushed to because we do have that issue. Um, in reference to this coming school year, I don't you know if we necessarily addressed it or we didn't address it. In reference to students having IDs, uh, are students going to be given an ID? Because I found this year we had some with them, some without them, and uh, I just want to make sure that um, we follow House Bill 1778 that went into effect July 1, 2022, where you have to include the um, national suicide uh, prevention on the back of the ID. It must be there with a number where students could reach out immediately. So, um, in reference to the dress code, that, that is already on the books. Um, the phone. And I, I did hear Ms. Medina say, were we going to uniforms? We're not going to uniforms, but we cannot start another year with belly outs, with bras, with shorts so short that I couldn't pay attention. I, I didn't know what, I thought, I didn't know we were in the club, what, where we were. Um, that's important, and I, I think there's just something that we need to work with our young ladies with. I'm not saying that they have to wear a dress down to their ankle, but if you're going to wear shorts, at least have it to your knee. You're in school. It's a learning institution. It's very distracting. Um, for the phones, that's going to, um, we're going to really, really have to get a handle on this whole phone thing. And I'm not necessarily one for taking the phones away, especially in what's going, with what's going on today. Um, but when I see kids are being cycle bullied via the cell phones, proviso East, West, and PMS and kids, we're going to have to do something. Uh, everybody takes their phones out. And I talked to a couple of things at Marshall High School in the city. Those kids have to release, give their phones up when they enter the building. They have little lockers. They are put in those lockers. They don't get those phones back until the end of the day. Uh, I'm sure it's something we can talk about more. But thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Oh, I have one question. In reference to this uh, College Board Suite Assessment, is this the same thing that we had last year or the year before? So we used another vendor last year, academic tutoring, um, to administer the practice PSAT and SAT. Uh, so we're um, partnering with the College Board, who is the author, obviously, of the SAT, um, so that we can have our files back uh, quicker and electronic and um, have those other benefits of the College Board that are outlined. Um, they're including the skills practice, connection to Khan Academy, connections to scholarships, mm -hmm. um, where we would have to work to do that separately. Okay. I have, a, have one more question. Mm -hmm. Sir, um, it, moving forward to one of the slides that said community and family engagement, it talked about parents on patrol, employee advisories, and town halls. And then Dr. Henderson, you mentioned um, also having a parent advisory. I was wondering uh, approximately like how many parents and what would be the process for choosing those parents? Last year, um, prior to the disruption, we had approximately 24 parents 
um, and we just wanted representation from all of our uh, townships. Okay, and all, all three schools, like, was that kind of just that, it, that is correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then do people apply, or do you just kind of reach out? No, they applied. Okay, and that was We the sent same. something out, and then they applied, yes. Okay, so same thing this year? Mm -hmm. Okay, Absolutely. thank you. Madam President. Yes, sir. And, and Mr. Gleason, I have a question for you. Um, and, and thank you for the effort, Dr. K, on the summer school. And, and I'm going to say this directly to the community. I'm not understanding if your freshman did not pass a class while they're not in summer school. I'm not understanding why any of our students that may have failed anything last year are not in summer school. Because if we compare these numbers, I'm not going to put you on the slide, Dr. Williams, with the scores, GPAs that we had last year, summer school should barely have enough seats for everyone that possibly needs to be there. So I'm asking the community, where are your students that did not pass a class as if that's okay going into another year. Because they should be in summer school making that class up. I, I'm, I'm gonna say this until I get off this board. As long as we allow students to fail, they'll take that option. We need policy that says if you fail a class, you're in summer school. We need policy that says if you're failing or behind, you're in credit recovery. It's not an option. You have to go. But as long as we're giving them the option to fail, then we have to look at ourselves as a board and say, what good are these policies? What good are these programs if they can opt in or opt out? And then the administration is spinning its wheels because the board's not putting any teeth. If we can legally compel students that are not making the grade to make the grade, why are we not doing that? It should not be an option, board. <clears throat> now we just bought tooth and nail with these students, with these teachers for a contract. Everything has to change. Your community, I'm talking to you. Your students need to be here. If they're having reading problems or math problems, there was a component, and thank you, Dr. Williams, for putting it up there. I know the administration is slack and slow to say this to parents. That's why the board has to say it. The majority of this responsibility community is on you. The, the, the administration and the teachers don't determine what your children put on to come into our buildings every morning. Let's stop playing games, people. Because when folks say our schools are not unsafe, they're talking about our children. So if there's issues with behavior, and there's issues with dress, and there's issues with cell phones, the community has to make a determination as to what type of schools they want. Seven people up here can only put stuff on pieces of paper. And teachers and administrators are here to teach and administrate, not to dress and do all of those things. So the community's going to have to really get on board with all of these great things that we're trying to do and make sure that that part is done. And Doc, I'm serious. If we can enforce this, at least if we can make policy that says you fail, you're here, or else, or we put them on a road to whatever, we need to have that down so that that's no longer an option in this district. Failure can't be an option, at least not from the board's perspective. I yield back, Madam President. Are there any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I hear your board. Thank you, Dr. Members. James. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Doc. All right, next we have up um, is our CFO and operation officer, Mr. Cedric Lewis. Good evening, board. Good evening. Good evening, sir. I am your chief financial and operations officer, Mr. Cedric Lewis. Uh, before I I'll uh, begin to present to you the financial information for the period ending June 30th, 2022. I'd like to call on Mr. L.T. Taylor to come and present to you all uh, actionable items surrounding facilities and also to give you an information surrounding um, construction projects that are going on as we speak. Thank you. Good evening, Board of Education, Superintendent, faculty, staff members. Uh, this evening we have a few uh, updates uh, from Gilbane. I'm going to be presenting the Gilbane RTAs and updates. Uh, Ms. Michelle McClendon is not in attendance tonight. Uh, we also have Perkinson Wheel here to give a few updates on schedule. 
exploratory demo and the West Science Labs and also our internships with uh, Perkins and Will. So the first item here is an RTA, a recommendation to award um, services for Proviso East, Proviso West for the general trade work for our access control. <coughs> Schaefer Brothers was the lowest responsible bidder at $380,800. Our next item is bid package 28A. This is access control for Proviso East, Proviso West, and the Math and Science Academy. We're we'll going to head in here at the Math and Science Academy to uh, control the doors throughout the district. The winning bidder and only bidder for this work was McWilliams Electric for $1,375,000. Last but not least, this uh, package, 11 Diaz and David, is for Proviso East High School for the track equipment. Uh, the winning bidder and only bidder was Edwin Anderson in the amount of six hundred. I'm sorry, sixty-two thousand one hundred fifty-two dollars. Is that a company? Edwin Anderson is a company. Moving on to the Gilbane construction update. Uh, here in the picture on the left, uh, uh, at Proviso East High School, construction is in full swing. Uh, you can notice in the middle of the corridors, all of the duct work is suspended from the ceiling, uh, and the work is moving forward in a great way. The next picture here is uh, uh, room 143. This is the suite for counseling offices. Uh, you'll notice in the middle picture, the bulkhead, the bulkhead is there, is being built. And this work is going really well, and we're really excited about this space. It's going to be completely remodeled for the counselors over at Proviso East High School at the beginning of the school year. This picture here is the boys' bathroom, which is on the northeast corner near room 155. This bathroom is going to receive a minor remodel, new ceilings, new control devices, new lighting, and uh, some minor fixture upgrades. Moving on to Proviso West, uh, this is on the C building near C201. Uh, you notice that there's huge holes in the, in the middle of the building there. That is for our trash chutes to get out all of the demo and bring in the new unit ventilators that are going to go on each side of each, each classroom on the middle floor. This is the brand new AC system going into the cafeteria over at Proviso West High School. Uh, this is going to bring a lot of value, a great investment for the district. We're going to be, be able to utilize that space for large gatherings and registration and cooling off all of the students, staff members, and community members once, once they're at Proviso West for registration. This last slide from Gilbane outlines the allowance track. Over at Proviso East High School, we still have $154,413 in the bank. Uh, we do expect that number to grow. Uh, we are on track, doing really well on the construction dollars. Uh, minor to uh, mid-level change orders have come in over at Proviso East. Moving on to Proviso West, $202,096. That is healthy as well, and we expect that number to keep growing as well. Any questions about the construction updates? Is there just one? Uh restroom that's going to be uh, fixed at Proviso East? For this phase, correct. Um, about five years ago, we did major renovations to most of the bathrooms at Proviso East High School. Uh, this bathroom is being renovated because it's right in the center of the construction, uh, which is room near room 155 on the northeast section of the building. Uh, so we had no choice but to do some work in that space and put new lighting and new ceilings in it. So you looked at the other washrooms there? Yes. Because I've been receiving reports uh, that they need upgrading. They're, all the bathrooms at Proviso East have not been upgraded. In the academic wing, a good 90% 90, 90 of them have been upgraded. The, the, I'm sorry, the athletic wing bathrooms need upgrading. 
Uh, and we also need to uh, upgrade some bathrooms in the ROTC area, which is around room 52, 54. But the vast majority of the washrooms received major renovation work, uh, I would say five or six years ago. Metropolitan was the contractor who did that work. Any okay. other questions? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Is there also going to be something similar done for the cafeteria proviso east? as far as air conditioning is concerned? Uh, we are actively engaging in conversations with Perkins and Wheel to update the facilities master plan. Uh, once we start that conversation, we will make sure that we have those engagement sessions with the principal and all the other student body groups to make sure that we bring the top priority projects to the top and then go from there. I'm not sure if the cafeteria will be a top priority project, uh, but we do need to put things in order of severity related to what we can get for the best bang for our buck. Because I think that having a cool room provides a less is brilliant. But it would be great for that same courtesy to be afforded to all the students at East that don't have a large cooling section area. I totally agree. And um, I can guarantee you we're working really hard to make sure that, that happens. Uh, LT, the parking lot, the teacher's parking lot at West, is that, is that scheduled for this summer or what are we doing with that? Yes, yeah, so the teacher's parking lot at Proviso West, um, from the new faculty gates right there at the D lot all the way back to the end of the C building, mm -hmm. is going to be all renovated, ripped up, starting around August 1st. I'm going to do that last. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, LT, on the, um, on the first uh, engineer's estimate, the, 60, the 380. On the uh, general trades, um, what was the uh, engineer's estimate? Zero. How come is the design estimate zero? So during the initial stages of uh, developing the access control scope of work, uh, we only put our sights on keypads, electronic uh, devices that's on the doors, and doing the scope, we noticed that it was a lot of doors on the exterior portions of the building that needed major repairs. A lot of piano hinges door devices, brand new locking mechanisms. So we had to develop a scope to make sure that what we're going to spend on access control was going to work in tandem together. So there was no design estimate for this work. But we are under budget as we speak for this project. It's just 380. I mean, this is the first time I'm going to say this. It just looks like it might be an irresponsible bidder compared to the access controls the electricians have. I mean, based on the work. So to, I mean, it just looks like he might. That was a huge concern of Gilbane and mine as well. So uh, on June 9th, we had a scope review with Schaefer Brothers, and we outlined all of the scope components, mm -hmm. and he did answer yes to all of it. Uh, we do believe DBM Services <coughs> came in at one million eight hundred ninety-seven thousand dollars. We do believe they didn't understand the scope during the scope review. So that's why that price is like four times as high. Right. That's what we believe what Schaefer Brothers will be under contract and will be held accountable to complete the complete scope of work for the door, general trades work at East, West, and the next time together. This is not whole walls, just doors. Got them out. We put them on there and just. Yeah. Some of the mullions need to be replaced, some of the locks, some of the hinges, some of the crash bars. Uh, okay. Um, how long was the bid out for the electrical contractors? Uh, and how many were invited? I know McWilliams for board members have been on that project since day one. So I mean, it's a good thing because they know the buildings, but you know, we also want to be competitive. I'm just wondering how long was the bid out? We make sure that all bids are out at a minimum of 10 days. I believe this bid was out 12 days. Uh, I need to get that date to get it to the superintendent's office to be solid on that. But we, for sure, get at least 10 days. We don't typically invite contractors to bid on projects. We normally put it in the newspaper, and anybody who want to bid on it can come in and bid. Newspaper or website? Both, correct? Yes, correct. I understand we don't want to put all our eggs in one basket, and then you know, we're going to spend one on the work, but we do need to get one or two good contractors you know, that we know of. So just yeah, so the only ones we have to, since day one. So the access control portion of the work that McWilliams, we're hoping to get approval for McWilliams. McWilliams is 
the electrical company, the old voltage contractor is Johnson Control, who knows all three facilities well. It's something like that. Yeah, so they're going to be doing a, a lot of heavy, intricate detail work in our buildings. And they know it pretty well. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to bring up Perkins and Wheel. Uh, good evening. Uh, thanks for having us back here so we can give you a little update, touch on a few topics. Um, some of these items uh, we presented in previous board meetings, but as always, please feel free to interrupt me, ask any questions or uh, any clarification that I can give. So, uh, the first thing we're going to cover is uh, just an update on the summer 2023 work and a design schedule update. Uh, so, you can see with this red bar here, uh, the purple blue line uh, intersecting it. This is the purple one. Um, we are uh, on the back end of the design process. We are near completing design development, uh, at which point those documents will be given over to Gilbane. We'll have a page turn with, the, uh, with LT and his team to confirm scope, and then we'll get a uh, construction estimate from Gilbane to make sure that we are tracking uh, 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 budget requirements. Uh, and then we'll proceed to uh, preparing bid documents with a target of late September, early October for bid issuance. Uh, carrying the rest of the schedule out, we accept, uh, expect to receive bids in October and November. And uh, I believe right now, Bill Bain is slated to present uh, uh, recommendations to award uh, at the December board meeting. Uh, at which point uh, another summer of this construction process begins. Uh, everything has been shifted forward a little bit. As uh, you are well aware, we are dealing with material acquisition lead times. So to try to accommodate that, we are uh, uh, moving the document preparation and bidding period forward uh, so we can avoid uh, any issues with that. Any questions on the schedule for the summer 2023 work? Okay. And Jessica's going to... Um, one sec. Yeah, sorry, give me one second, I'm all caught up. Okay, great. Sorry. Sorry, Billy. Okay, I'm good now. Okay. All right, um, so I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the exploratory demolition that we're doing for next summer's work. And the point of the exploratory demolition is to, for us to have a better understanding of the existing conditions of the schools. And we don't have enough uh, documentation of what the structure itself looks like right now, so we need to make a few holes in, in the ceiling um, in order to have a better understanding of what's there. And uh, this work was bid out by Gilbane. Um, but um, it came back at about uh, $50,000, and in order to save some, some money, uh, the district, LT Taylor, and Al McDonald uh, decided that uh, this work could probably be done by their maintenance staff. And it has been, uh, most of it has been done. Uh, we're still working on a few um, additional holes, and uh, we've started the survey, we've had a look, and it is really, really extremely helpful to go in because in some of the schools, there are a multitude of different structure types that are being used. So it really is essential for us to have a good idea of that work. So that's in the progress right now. Thank you, Alfie. You're welcome. You want to show the map? Yes, it, it was part of the, uh, Oh, there we go. All right. Um, so, uh, in, in this plan right now, uh, we have identified a number of different locations um, according to priorities. And um, as these openings have been created, um, we have determined if we need the priority two or priority three uh, uh, demolition areas as well. So as you can see from this, uh, most of them have been opened. We just have a few uh, left that will be opened uh, in the next, uh, next few days or so. Okay, the next thing uh, we're going to briefly discuss here uh, are the Proviso West Science Labs. Um, as you recall, the four biology labs at Proviso East are currently undergoing uh, extensive renovations, uh, and that is expected to be completed, I believe. Thank you. Uh, expected to be completed within the next six weeks. 
The Proviso West Science Labs will be comparable to the Proviso East Labs uh, so with uh, uh, equity between the two schools. So hopefully pretty soon you'll be able to walk through a, a pretty uh, strong representative example of what the Proviso West Labs uh, will look like. So just to uh, refresh your memory as to what uh, these renovations involve, uh, essentially all new floor uh, wall uh, finishes, it's being connected to the new central uh, uh, HVAC plant, so we'll have air conditioning and heating. Um, uh, new plumbing work, new electrical work, uh, new doors, new science casework, student tables, teacher station, and fixtures. Um, one thing that is slightly different at Proviso West, and this came about through uh, several uh, discussion sessions we had, uh, both with Alex Ashoff and the science teachers at West, was the idea of creating uh, what uh, we're kind of uh, calling a science commons. And this is uh, essentially taking one of the prep rooms that uh, was decided could be consolidated through the use of you know, new casework and, and better storage, not necessarily needing more storage, but better storage. We could reclaim some of that space and create uh, essentially a flex room that could have different style of furniture that you would normally see in a typical science classroom. This would uh, be open to uh, two adjacent classrooms, and I'll kind of use my mouse cursor here. Hopefully you can see this space right here. But it would be, uh, have, be equipped with overhead doors so that way teachers on either side or potentially both sides uh, could open up the space and utilize it. It could be a science club space. It could allow for more independent small group study while the remainder of the class works on other items. Um, it could also allow for the district to leverage a uh, particular piece of equipment or lab setups and have it shared between the two spaces. Um, this idea was something that was received very strongly by the science teachers uh, at Proviso West. So uh, this is something that will be incorporated into the scope um, and really excited to see how teachers can use this and uh, incorporate it into their curriculum. Uh, as kind of a little zoom in to some of the uh, major scope items, uh, in the typical lab layout. Uh, if you go into a typical science lab that was constructed, let's say in the 50s and 60s, there's a very clear deline delineation. This is your lecture area, this is your lab area. And you know, they were very rigid and inflexible rooms. Well now with, with modern uh, high school science labs, flexibility is really one of the key things that, uh, uh, is demanded by uh, instructors. And so what we end up doing is we put all the utilities along the perimeter and the center of the room is occupied by movable tables. This allows the teacher to uh, instruct in a variety of different formats, through traditional lecture testing formats, small groups, large groups, uh, as well as lab uh, scenarios, where you can see the, you know, the sinks along the perimeter here um, with the dock, uh, docking of the student tables. Uh, so these rooms, again, will be getting all new epoxy resin countertops, drop-in sinks, and ba uh, backsplashes. Um, overhead power reels, one thing that was strongly communicated to the design team during our meetings with the instructors is the need for power. Obviously all the students are one-to-one, -one, have their Chromebooks, as well as uh, uh, various lab activities that need power uh, to be supported. So lab overhead power reels, again, just trying to give the maximum amount of flexibility to the instructors in this space. Any questions about the science lab renovations? Uh, and just to clarify, this, uh, these are slated to be completed in uh, summer 2023, so for the 2023-2024 school year. Was that by the engineer, the epoxy resin countertop? Uh, no, that, that's, that's base scope. Um, that, that's pretty much the standard countertop in any high school science library. Yeah. What was six weeks to completion? You said something was six weeks to completion. Oh, uh, the Proviso East Science Lab? The East Science Yeah, approximately six weeks. I, I have to defer to Gil Bain on the exact schedule for when those will be completed. But um, so if you want to get a sense as to what the new science labs are going to look like uh, once the East uh, Biology Labs are completed, that will give you a, a pretty good feel for what the West Science Labs will look like. Thank you. Last question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> to refresh my memory. Uh, so the uh, exploratory demolition, that's for for 2023 for the air conditioning? Correct. Yeah, it, it, these are all concurrent. Um, you know, we try to uh, work with the district to uh, collect as many logical projects together so that way it's not like you tear out a wall this year and then you renovate the space next year so you have to tear it out again. Um, so the exploratory demolition really focused on building the Proviso East uh, where it's the oldest portion of the building that we have the least amount of existing information about. 
Any other questions on science labs? Otherwise, Jessica will give uh, the internship. Thank you. All right. So um, I uh, am pleased to inform you all that we have a intern uh, working for our office. She is a recent PMSA graduate. Uh, her name is uh, Dulce Rivera. And last year, she was actually an intern for uh, Gilbane during the summer. Um, she's been with our firm now for about three weeks right now, and she's been doing a really wide variety of tasks. Uh, she's doing some work uh, for us, specifically working on proviso schools, so we actually get to work on the schools that she just graduated from. Um, she's been helping us out uh, once a week or so, um, coming to the schools and doing construction administration, helping us uh, take photos, walk through the sites, document the conditions, uh, she's also helping us uh, work on the design documents for next summer's phase of work as well. Um, and she is also doing, uh, we put together some firm-wide and office-wide events uh, for our interns because we have uh, some interns from both high school and college. Uh, they are in the process of going on some tours of some recently completed Perkins and Will projects. Uh, she's also assisting us with our living design index. Um, which documents our amount of sustainability for all projects. And uh, right now, as you can see in this um, photo right here, she's working on a firm-wide intern design competition, where her, her and her partner were working on a uh, chair um, design. Um, so yes, yeah, so she will be here with us for the rest of the summer, and then she goes off to college in the fall. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Um, uh, Madam President, I would just like to say that Dosi, um, as you know, one of our fine students here at PMSA, um, was um, um, a member of, of a matter of fact, she was the co-president of the Superintendent Roundtable, and she received your inaugural scholarship, uh, and she will be attending um, the Technology Institute of Illinois. Illinois. Yes, absolutely. So we're so very yeah, you would say that. Um, Mr. Gleason attended that university as well. So we're so so very happy uh, for those. Thank you all so very much. You know, uh, Dr. Henderson and uh, Perkins and Will, when I looked at that photo it just reminded me that why can't we do this with all the uh, the trades that come in where can they do internships, especially you know, the electrical plumbing and carpenter. Uh, why can't we you know, we talk to Gil Bain and maybe we get a little bit more students to in the summer. <laughs> like that, you know, work with these electrical contractors, plumbers. We like that. It's an opportunity for them to see if they like it or not, or just like what they're doing. So. Very good. Thank you, Madam President. Hey, Sam, I would accept that as recompense for our minority contractor issues. So that's a perfect idea. If we could get some expansion on opportunities for our students in the intern area, I will allow to lay off a little bit on the issues that we're having with minority contractors. Uh, I would just like to mention too that likely at the uh, next month's board meeting we'll ask Dulce to attend and give a short presentation on what she's done this summer as, as part of her internship. So we can look forward to that. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Taylor, for the overview. Uh, before you this evening, board members, on the last page of Section 12I is the Treasurer's Report for the period ending June 30th, 2022. I'd like to impress upon the board this evening that these are very preliminary numbers. They are very preliminary because during this time of year, there are accounting entries called accruals that have to be posted. Those accruals reflect revenues and expenditures that have not been posted to the general ledger as of yet. Um, for example, uh, there are a number of federal programs that are our final expenditure, well, our four quarter expenditure reports are due on the 20th of the month. Of course, that's next week. Those accrual, those four quarter expenditure reports have to be pushed back into these numbers uh, by the auditors. Speaking of auditors, Mr. Moore Moody reached out to our external auditors in June uh, to inquire when the audit for 2022 would begin and he didn't get a return. So yesterday, he followed up and reached out to the external auditors again to see when they were gonna start the audit. The auditors responded to him first thing this morning to tell him that they had staffing issues and they had to make some executive decisions. That executive decision resulted in them dropping Proviso 209 as one of their clients. 
So next month we'll be bringing to you a recommendation for an auditor uh, to start the work. One of the things that I want to impress upon the board this evening is this might, it's not a probable, I mean it's not a, a, a in fact, that it could lend to a late submission of our audit because the preliminary work should have began, worst case, last week. As we look at the financial statements, there's something that I'd like to bring to your attention, attention that was recently uh, given to us from the Township Treasurer. There was a news article uh, that he presented to us um, last Thursday that um, reflected property tax bills going out late. If the property tax bill goes out late, that means that the property tax revenue comes to us late. Uh, Chairman Preckwinkle has uh, instituted a program to assist school districts and other taxing en entities not have to do what's called a tax anticipation warrant, which is just a fancy word for a loan. But owing to the very strong financial position of uh, Proviso 209, we wouldn't need it anyway. So I'd be remiss to not bring that to your attention so that you know that our tax collections are going to be slow in the fall. That's going to impact the fiscal year 2023 budget. Next slide, please. So as we talk about budgeting for 2023, the first bullet that I bring before you uh, surrounds uh, budget development. There is a law that very, very few school districts adhere to in the state of Illinois, whereby the board has to authorize the development of the tentative budget for the ensuing year. Again, very few school districts do this. Um, what I'm going to do for us in the fall, probably as early as October, is I'm going to bring a resolution to the board to get your permission to begin drafting the tentative budget for 2024. That will make sure that we're adhering to that particular uh, piece of statute. But as we move forward and develop for the budget, next month I will present to you a uh, tentative budget for 2023 and ask the board to authorize uh, us to proceed with a public hearing and posting that we have to put in the newspaper, et cetera, to adhere to state statute. And then in September, I'll bring you the budget for official approval and then we'll file that particular budget with uh, the Illinois State Board of Education to ensure full compliance, and then we're fine. Again, in October, I'll bring you the resolution to get your permission to authorize to the development for the 2024 budget to fully comply with our statutes, and then we're, we're set. And I'll entertain any questions. Madam President? Yes. With, with, so Miller and Cooper are no longer our, our yes. audit company. That's so right. how late will that audit possible so what's the latest it will be and how that doesn't impact any of this that you just said to us no sir it has absolutely no bearing on the budget that you know i don't want to paint this cloud gloom and doom right but we got to find an audit firm who will accept us and come in and perform the audit on behalf of proviso 209 and we'll be i, I tell you i'll be pounding the pavement to try to find a, a firm that you all can feel comfortable with that can come in and get that work for us. Is that a difficult process? This time of year, actually it is, because most audit firms have already scheduled their work for school systems. We're saying we, they would be coming in behind. Correct. Okay. And then they'll have to get the working papers from the Miller Company, et cetera, et cetera, um, who, and then they'll have to get a peer review, which means they're gonna do a deeper dive in the audit uh, in financials, which I'm fine with, to make sure everything is to their likeness. You have questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, one of the tools that we've used um, over the years is a five-year financial plan. We were required to uh, report one to the state upon having our uh, financial oversight panel leave. We have not updated that five-year financial plan. Do you have any plans to update the five-year financial plan in order for us to make informed decisions in regards to contracting and everything else? So in a comprehensive by, uh, budget document, uh, and I've done these in several school systems, you're required to do a multi-year mm -hmm. financial plan. Okay. And that's part of what I plan on bringing to Proviso 2 now. Yeah, because the last time we did one, I think it was 2020. Yes, ma'am, that is absolutely forthcoming. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I had one more question. My 
my understanding in regards to the budget was that uh, the working cash fund was supposed to have at least six months worth of salaries in, it in order for us to maintain our financial standing, uh, which we have been, of course, improving. Um, Proviso has been um, steadily getting higher and higher ratings, which, of course, is, is positive. But one of the requirements the FOP had was that we have several months worth of, of salaries in the working cash. On, in, and, and, we, and right now we only have $13,000. Um, could you talk to me about, uh, are we planning to change things around? Is this, because the standing that we're in, we're, we're into a different practice, could you, could you? So the financial oversight panel, that could have just been a recommendation from them. It's not it, was a, a, it was a requirement at the time. That was a requirement under the financial operating, over the financial oversight panel. That is not a requirement according to state statute. Very good. So we're, we're in a great shape financially. We're on a 3.9 on a 4 pointer scale. That's almost perfect. So we're in, we're in very good shape. And I can assure you that the financial team, as well as with Dr. Henderson, I'm going to tell you, he can screen, squeeze a penny into a Lincoln screen. Um, uh, we're going to make sure we stay in the financial position that the school system is in. We will. Thank, Thank you. You. Um, you have some uh, agenda item for approval, sir. Next slide. Okay. So again, before you this evening uh, is the bill list, uh, donations report, uh, general trade, uh, as Mr. Uh, Taylor has presented to you, the access controls as Mr. Taylor has presented to you, and also the track equipment as Mr. Taylor has presented to you. Thank you so very much. Okay. Thanks, sir. Mr. Swanson. One more quick presentation after Mr. Swanson. Good evening, board. Good evening, Good evening sir. I want to start by uh, introducing our summer interns. So we have Caleb McDaniel from Proviso East, David Barretta from Proviso West, Keith Torres from Proviso Math and Science Academy, and Layla Hill from Proviso Math and Science Academy. So they've started with our IT department, working hand in hand, and uh, hit the ground running. And uh, we're excited to have them on board. And we thank you for your vote of confidence around these young people. Yes. Thank you all so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Internship update to kind of go off that is that we're working directly with HP to form a hands-on partnership with the IT internship program. HP is one of our key partners and what we're looking to do is have the students work directly with HP to repair out-of-warranty devices for students, staff, and um, old devices that we would donate back to the community. So we're looking at continuing this internship and uh, you know, tying our partnership closer with HP. Um, internship expansion, what we're looking to do and looking in the future is that we're considering expanding the IT internship program uh, during the school year. So what that would entail is that there would be a stipend for students. This would be available to seniors only on their off period, um, one hour a day for a maximum of three days a week. And what that would allow them to do, to do is to work directly with the IT department, and um, this internship would be at no cost to the district. It would be funded by our key Microsoft, HP, and Mindsight um, partners, and we're looking to explore that as a internship expansion for the upcoming school year. District printer update. Um, in the past, uh, printers were purchased um, from personal funds, department funds, um, really any funds all over the board, and um, IT uh, moving forward for cost savings and for um, overall consistency across the district is that we're going to only service Xerox printers um, for cost savings and user experience consistency. Um, a lot of the printers are just in an office that somebody decided to bring in and purchase, and then they go come to IT and they ask us to purchase toner for that. And we have you know hundreds of printers that could be across the district that we're purchasing random amounts of toner for. Um, just as an example, and this is a low number by all means in uh, May. So towards the end of the school year, we spent a thousand ninety-six dollars and eighty-five cents on non-contract printers. Um, we have Xerox printers under contract deployed at all three buildings. Um, that's service contract and supply contract, and it really cuts down on costs. So what we're looking to do is continue. Um, the excellent service that we have with the Xerox printers and only service them to ensure that we're not spending money on toner and printers that um, are not under contract. 
Are we going to make some printers in strategic places, though, too, so teachers have the availability to use it? Because sometimes there's, they've got to get something quick. So is, is there going to be like access? Yeah, correct. So they are currently strategically placed throughout the district, but we're going to reevaluate um, the placement of them to make sure that they're in the key areas, as well as if there was an area that came up that we realized that there was a direct need for a printer, um, we'll look to get a printer in there and get that printer under contract just to cut down on service and cost overall. Our mine site assessment update. Um, thank you for approving this last board meeting. Um, this is our infrastructure and network assessment for the district. Um, we've been assigned a project manager and we're set to begin the assessment shortly and um, we have an updated timeline um, and milestone dates to come. So we're right in the workings of that and that kind of bounces right over to our phone system update. Uh, so we're currently in the budgetary phase of Ring Central um, to get a system replacement for our phone system across all three buildings. Um, that would entail a uh, roll, like phase rollout in, for uh, key critical areas across the district and a wireless option um, to make sure that we can hit all the critical areas of the district. Some areas have old phone lines, may not have Ethernet availability, so we're going to have that wireless option to ensure that when we're rolling out the phone system, we have um, a phone where it needs to be and it's rolled out and integrated properly. Okay, any questions? All right, our last presentation. Thank you, Mr. Swanson. Thank you. <coughs> will be from Mr. Davis around our um, summer sports camp. You have two minutes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Got to save the fun stuff for last. Uh, good evening, President Patterson, board members, and Dr. Henderson. I'm going to give you a very brief update uh, on our summer camp program and just share a few highlights with you. Uh, summer camp has gone great. It's gone according to plan. All of the things that I presented last month are happening. Uh, we have uh, more than 330 students registered in the camps program. Uh, that's both schools combined. We have about 175 at Proviso East and maybe 160-ish at uh, Proviso West. And uh, we follow the curriculum just as we planned it. Today was our 10th day. So we completed session one. The summer camp program was scheduled for 20 days. So we go into session two uh, beginning tomorrow. Uh, our daily curriculum has been great. Kids have been busy in the evenings. They practice fundamentals. And uh, we've had a 15-minute presentation each day with our health clinic. We partnered, and uh, they've presented things like nutrition and hydration and concussion awareness. So that's been really great. I just want to share a few pictures with you from the camps. Here you see some Proviso East campers. Next slide, we have Proviso West campers. Here are some items that we purchased for the camp. Of course, it's been really hot, so we've set up uh, water stations and we've provided coolers, um, also water bottles for each camp participant. Uh, we've provided a mini first aid kit for all the camp directors. Uh, along with drawstring bags and uh, folders to keep materials that we've provided. Here you see some campers in action in the batting cages and in the weight room doing the condition and the practice, the repetition is going to make them more competitive and more skilled. Here at Proviso West, there's soccer, basketball. Here's a, a picture of the Loyola Health Clinic doing a presentation on concussion awareness. You also see our soccer and basketball teams and, and all the things going on. We've also had a counselor come in and do the NCAA clearinghouse information just so kids and parents would be aware of what the requirements are for that. We always have our veteran coaches come up and share their experiences uh, with our student athletes and our campers. Uh, two of our best coaches from the community. Again, more pictures from the playing fields and the areas that the campers are in uh, during the camp program. We appreciate you, you, sir. We appreciate you so very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Badala. Good 
Good evening, Madam President, Madam mm -hmm. Vice President, the board. Good evening, sir. Uh, Good evening. Happy to be here. Uh, I just wanted to give a, a brief overview of um, staffing and enrollment. Uh, uh, Dr. Henderson and I, uh, we met with our instructional leaders at the, at the buildings and we looked at the projected uh, enrollment and then we looked at uh, what our, our building leaders were putting together as it relates to their master schedule and we looked for some potential efficiencies. Um, you know, and when we uh, went into this process, we were driven by three goals. One, first and foremost, is to ensure that our students are getting uh, properly served to facilitate their success in education. Two, we want to ensure that any decisions that we make as it relates to staffing uh, is going to comport with the PTU agreement. And then finally, we want to ensure that we as a district are being fiscally responsible. So a bit about our, our, um, how, we, how we went about this process. So first, we looked at the projected enrollment for the 2022-2023 school year. Uh, these numbers came uh, from the, the uh, administration of the buildings. It also came from IWAS. So we're, we're, these are obviously fluid numbers. Uh, and these are projections, uh, but based on these numbers, we then asked our, our um, principals, our building leaders, to provide us with their uh, tenanted master schedules, their draft master schedules based on PowerSchool. Uh, and then we, we made determinations as to potential FTEs. Uh, so starting with the, the Math and Science Academy, uh, they have been allocated 55 FTEs currently. Uh, they currently have 50 FTEs. Uh, and as we, we looked at, at where we can find some efficiencies, uh, we realized that, that PMSA uh, may be overstaffed, is overstaffed, by five FTEs. So uh, our amended FTE for, for the Math and Science Academy is 45. We did the same with Proviso East. They're cur currently allocated 112 FTE. They currently have 101 uh, FTE. Uh, so we did the same process. We asked them to bring their draft hour school, and then based on the projected numbers, we found some efficiencies uh, in five. So we, we were able to reduce, or we're projecting a reduction of five FTE at Proviso East, which gives them an amended FTE of 96. Um, and then we, we did that with West. And so those numbers are 123 has been allocated to West. They currently have 119. So again, same thing, going through the, the draft master schedule, looking for those efficiencies. We determined that they're potentially overstaffed. They are overstaffed by seven FTEs, so their amended FTE for this school year is 112. And just a, just a bit of word about you know, what that means, essentially that means we, we looked at, at vacancies that are coming up that are current that may not need to be filled, and then the, the building administration is gonna go back with these numbers and they're gonna re uh, rework their master schedules to, to fit this number. Um, as the board knows, coming out of the, the last collective bargaining agreement, uh, we've extended the day, eighth period day, for East and West. PMSA already had that. Um, and that's obviously a cost. And so the projected cost of the, the uh, extended day was going to be nine FTE. So we took an average, and this is an absolute average. 19, 19. 19, 19. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, 19, 19. So we took an average of the salary and the benefits, which is approximately $83,000, multiplied that by 19, and so you get that, that almost $1.6 million cost. Well, based on the evaluation that we conducted myself, Dr. Henderson, and the, the staff, um, 
we were able to reduce our FTEs by 17. So that's a projected cost savings of approximately 1.4 million. So instead of the uh, 19 FTEs costing 1.6 million, uh, you know, the amended cost for that eight period day uh, is approximately $166,000. And we think that that is uh, what? Fiscal, very fiscally <laughs> responsible. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Let me just um, make sure I address this. Again, this, these numbers are fluid at this time. But what I want you to know, that this, this district has been overstaffed for some time. Let me give you an example. And I don't want to get into the weeds, but let's go back. Let's go to PMSA. Now, PMSA has an allocated FTE. That's what you guys have been approving for years, of 55. To this date, or as of today, where's Mr. No? They currently have 50 FTEs. Now, I've built some room in here, Mr. Wagner, to address just in case we get more students. Thank you. But let me tell you something, board members. 900, what is that number? They have a total number of 939. Now get your phone, your personal phone. And I want you to say 939 divided by 50. What number should you get? It should be 18.7. That means for the most part, it's a, the student-teacher ratio is 18 to 1. Did you hear me? The student-teacher ratio is 18 to 1. In which classes? Your core content areas. But most of the classes... I'm not going to argue with you. Be quiet and listen. Excuse me? I didn't start. So, here we are. I'm sorry. Take the mic with so, you. So here we are. Take the mic with you. 939 divided by 50. Now we'll do 939 divided by 30. able to add that eight period day back still under 30 we can go up to 35 Mr. Gleason like 30 and we're saving the district 1.4 million dollars and that concludes our presentation. Thank you, Dr. Madam President, I make a motion to adjourn. Absolutely. Yes, Mr. Gleason just made a great point. That's 1.4 each year. Each year. Come on now. Yeah. Wow. Yes, I'm done, Madam President.
this time I would like to uh, the president's report. Take a moment of silence for a current student and her demise, Jordan Scott, and a former student, Richard Johnson, class of 84. If we could just take a moment of silence. Thank you. I would also like to take this opportunity to say kudos to Proviso East and the alumni for the picnic um, that took place on Saturday. It was well attended. Um, it was a great opportunity. Um, looks like uh, Mr. Randy McFarland, who was a part of that, is out in the audience. Thank you. Uh, don't forget August 6th, Proviso West High School will have their alumni picnic. And so, um, don't have a whole lot to uh, say about that. And that pretty much concludes the President's report. I am not one that's going to give you a report every month. That's, that's not who I am. Um, However, we will move on to the consent agenda. Since um, the comments, I'm sorry, but I don't think we have any. Yeah, we actually have two. Uh, Did you get those consent? When did those come? Because I asked at seven if we had citizen comments. It was Randy. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yes, we have two. Uh, I believe we have three minutes. Uh, all right, so let me read the, the because they told, I'm sorry, I was told we did not have any citizen comments. At this time, we have citizen comments. The Board of Education opens the floor to citizens' comments. The board will receive public comments from any individuals present this evening and have submitted a request to address the board per the established procedure. We believe that all participants in the meeting desire, desire the best outcomes for our students families and communities. As a reminder, this meeting is being live streamed and we will also be our we will also be archived and available on the district's website. Yes we have two. Our uh, first name is uh, Randy McFarland. Good evening, Madam Board, President, board members. Good evening, sir. Hi Ben Anderson. Um, I'm going to be real quick. Um, speaking on behalf, I'm just one of the many alumni that was at the park at the cookout. It was a provisory all class alumni cookout. Uh, we have Desiree Langston, who was who the chair of the committee. She's here also. Uh, on behalf of myself, my alumni classmates, uh, first I want to thank you, Madam Ward, for acknowledging uh, Richard Johnson. He's like a big brother in us, class 84, and I also do Jordan. So I'm gonna get off that subject real quick before I start crying. Um, but on behalf of the board members, of the classmates, we want to thank you. There's no way in the world we could have pulled off um, having an alumni. If I, I took the total tally and I, I estimated that maybe 5,000 alumni alone was out there. The reason why I know that is that the eldest alumni is class of 1951, this kind of brand. And just so you know, she's in, you saw her in the news. Uh, by the way, great interview, uh, Madam Ms. Tr uh, Teresa Kelly, alumni Teresa Kelly. Uh, just so you know, Ms. Bradley is an incredible storyteller. Uh, I've listened to some of her stories. She has a wealth of knowledge about Maywood Wood and how life was for her going to Hawaii's Reese back in the 50s. And she's, uh, she's an author also, not in this. Um, so I took the numbers and on the average, each class probably has somewhere between 57, 70, 100 uh, classmates out there. So you do that over five decades, you're looking at over 5,000. That's not even including the little kids that was running around. And some of the IH, IHM, St. Joe's, Walter Lutheran, and yes, Proviso West. Where they tell us, we'll be there on the six for the ass. Uh, but it was love. It was all love, and there was no issues. Um, you know, some people were a little irritated because they couldn't get in the park and share all the love. 
But I want to say that uh, some of the staff, LT, Taylor was huge in us pulling this off. Huge. Um, having access to the parking lot. The main parking lot got filled up probably about 9 o'clock. So having this PNS park, PNSA parking lot was huge. And then when I came and asked um, Ms. Kelly and Dr. Henderson about providing the East parking lot later, they, I couldn't even get out and say yes. So having those parking lots is huge. We will need them next year. We will do our best to take care of the property because this is home to us also. We're going to take care of so um, seeing you guys there, Rodney and, and Della, anyone else who attended, um, I mean, it was great seeing you guys there. Sam, uh, just know this, everybody's welcome. You, uh, don't wait on anybody. You know, don't wait on anybody, you're welcome at all times. Um, I want to also thank, um, you got a staff that named Jeff Madlock. Jeff Madlock was huge in us getting access to the golf cart. LT not only helped us with the parking lot, but he also had his staff from providing the West End here assist us with getting those golf carts. Um, from the Westchester Golf Course. Those golf courses were huge in our elders being transported from the front gate to the tent area. So that was huge. Ted Edmond was huge in helping us. Marcus Obrowski was huge in helping us off the clock on his own time. Um, Mr. Laverdes Robinson was huge. Principal Ryan Paul is always giving us access to our alma mater. So that's huge also. And when we see our own alumni like Jerry Garrett, <laughs> Tiffany Jenkins, Ms. Carissa Gillespie and the other one that's who work at our at our events. That's huge to us. So we want to thank them also and the Parents Advisory Council. We want to thank Ms. Corey Hobbs and her associates for feeding the band. The band was dynamic. I'm not going to be there, but it's from the heart. Thank you all. We couldn't have done this without you. Is there other Person that was yes, she is. So we can see her. Yeah, she's just she's she's next. She's next. She's next. She's I'm a little shy, so I'm going to have Randy McFarland stand here with me. So I'm going to address the board, um, Madam President, board members, and Dr. Henderson. I'm Desiree Langston, the visionary for the. Speak to the mic so they can hear you. I'm Desiree Langston. I was the committee chair that came up with the um, cookout that we had on this past Saturday. And so. Randy was very instrumental on the committee that was pulled together by myself. And let me just give you a brief history of how this cookout came about. I put a post out in 2019 and said, why doesn't the greatest um, school have an all-alumni cookout? I see the city schools, they have this cookout. Why don't we have this cookout? So from there, our Proviso East alums, they chimed in on that um, post, and we created a committee with Randy being a part of it. So it's about eight of us that came together, and we have built and built over these past three years to do what we did out there on Saturday. So I wanted to be here to thank the board for all of the assistance that was provided for us on that day with the carts and everybody that Randy mentioned. It's appreciated because I didn't know everybody to reach out to, but he did. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate that, Randy, along with other board members who happen to know a lot more people than I do. But I am from the great class of 1995, and so <laughs> I am so thankful that the board was out there with us to celebrate that epic event. And, you know, I was asked the very first day, will we do it again next year? And I almost felt like people were cursing at me because I was so tired. And I said, huh. But our goal is to do it each year. And so we are always looking for your support um, any way that we can. And I want to thank you personally, Rodney, because I met you out at the park for inviting me here today. So if I have not followed protocol, protocol well, you have. You have. <laughs> I, I didn't know to go fill out the comment form, no, so okay. I, do, I do apologize. Okay. But thank all of you, and I just appreciate the support that was given. Thank you. Thank you. That's all for citizens' comments.
May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda items? Is there any to be pulled? Um, yes, Madam President, I would like to pull two items. 12B, the bill list, and 12I, Dormco College Essentials. 12B and 12I? Yes. Okay. Yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to pull um, A, 12A, and... I can't hear you. Say that again. I'd like to pull 12A and 12J. Are there any other? Madam President, I would like to pull 12J4. So right now it's 12B, 12I, 12A, and 12J. Is that correct? Yes. Madam President, is this in the meeting you're asking to pull the entirety of the personnel report or a specific item on the personnel report? The entirety. Do you want to vote on each higher, higher by higher? Is that what you're, or you just want to vote on one way on the whole list? Oh, I would like to just separate that from the consent agenda. But you're still okay with the whole voting on it as an omnibus altogether? Not inside the consent agenda. Yes. No, no, I understand that, but all the items can be voted on in one package as well. Now. Yes. So she's pulling 12J? Yeah. She's yeah. pulling the whole thing. The whole thing. agenda. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we have a motion to approve the consent agenda on the exception of 12B, 12I. 12A and 12J. So moved. Second. Discussion? Ms. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Patterson? Aye. Ms. Grant? Aye. Mr. Valtieres? Aye. Ms. Medina? Aye. Mr. Alexander? Aye. Mr. Wagner? Aye. Motion carries. May I have a motion to approve 12B? So moved. Second. Please call the roll. Are we skipping it? The discussion? Skipping it. What? 12A. Oh, 12A, I'm sorry. So moved. Second. Discussion? Discussion. The minutes don't reflect the content of a lot of what was said. And I, I don't feel that we should be improving it without the content of, of, of uh, what people actually say. Call the roll. Mr. Alexander? Aye. Ms. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Medina? Abstain. Ms. Patterson? Aye. Ms. Grant? Aye. Mr. Valtieres? Aye. Mr. Wagner? Aye. Motion carries. Motion carries. 12B. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Discussion. Um, I pulled this one because there I said a lot of disturbing things in this split list. Um, and I know this money has already been spent and we have to pay bills, but the way it's being spent, um, I don't think is in a way that's really benefiting our students in several cases. Um, for example, all of my tabs here, my post-its are, are for food, for food that didn't necessarily go to students, and I'm not entirely sure on that because it's not noted, and I actually ran out of post-its. Um, and in a lot of cases, we're spending hundreds of dollars, for example, at Juul, um, but the line item is marked educational supplies. How are we spending hundreds of dollars? Is that for culinary? Culinary? I'm we sorry, have a culinary? Is that for culinary kitchen? It's culinary. What are you talking about? 
then it should be denoted. No, you should, call, you should call and ask before you make assumptions like There's that. There's no response given. Or please, I don't think that we should. No, I don't. Go ahead. This is an amateur hour. This is a professional organization that is spending $95 million a year asking for bills to be fully accounted for so we know what we're spending taxpayer money on is not something to be taken lightly. So when we do have things, for example, on page 77 of the bill list, where we spent $127 at McDonald's, but there's no denotation about what it was, but the very next item clearly says, Arena Day Refreshments, purchased at Sam's Club. Okay, we know what Arena Day was. That was for our incoming freshman students at all three schools. Mm -hmm. Right? That makes sense. Why can't we put it on all these other items if these dollars are being spent for students so we can see that or not? It's part of being transparent. It's part of being accountable. And it's also having people or things denoted correctly. If all these dual purchases are for the culinary classroom, then we should say that because we do have other items that clearly state these are for the culinary classes. This is not a difficult concept. Um, but there are a lot of, there's a lot of money being spent in ways that is not benefiting students. Um, and one of the big things I really want to call attention to, uh, we have a tab, or sorry, a bill for UIC catering in Chicago, which I'm going to go ahead and assume is graduation, $6,440.94. Did we feed our graduates at graduation? <laughs> No, but you pay for catering. You pay for what you get. You pay for catering. Who, you, you weren't How that, many people were fed for $6,440? I'm probably sure it was the board members that uh, made it important for them to attend the student's graduation and the faculty that worked. Um, Ms. Grant? Okay, so yeah. how many people would that be? 40? Well, I wasn't there to say it and count, but let me be real clear. Every month, you transparency is what each of us ran on. And then all of a sudden, people start taking other directions. We're no longer transparent. I sent out a text message on Saturday or Sunday, if my mind serves me correct, that stated, if you have any concerns or questions in regards to this board meeting tonight, if you could please get those questions or concerns to Dr. Henderson by 12 noon Monday, because all of the stuff that you're asking now, those are questions that could have been answered. But what I'm finding, and I just, I actually pray that we stop it. We wait until we get here, and then we grandstand and put it under the pretense of <laughs> we're not being transparent. I worked in the district 20 years. I've always known that the district of the jewels and shop, they don't tell you if they're buying food for 18 kids. They, they, they stock their pantry up with food. Um, in reference to how many people ate let the record reflect the Board of Education has a budget line. We are not doing anything that we shouldn't be doing. There is a budget line there, and we're within our budget line. So if we could just ask our questions, get the questions answered here, but when we come and say, oh, take a look at my book, I have all these things, that's, that's a form of grandstanding, and it's unfair. Either you vote for the budget or you don't. But you have not voted to pay the teachers to pay any bills for months. All you have to do is pick out what you're choosing not to pay. But to say don't pay anybody, I think that's wrong. Because we gotta pay our bills. Um, if the bill was $6,000, trust me, we didn't put the monies in our pockets. You have to pay, you, you were downtown Chicago. It's not cheap. $6,000. Mm -hmm. I am. That's pretty cheap. Reading the very top line of the Board of Education member oath of office. 
Right after we're sworn in, mm -hmm. I further swear that I shall respect taxpayer interest by serving as a faithful protector of the school district's assets. This board book is public. Everyone here has a chance to go through it. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. I ask my questions that I have, but also that people ask me. And I think that when information is not included, that's something that has to be addressed publicly. That is accountability. That's accountability. But it's also okay. a form of grandstanding. Election is coming up. I, I see what's happening. I've been, uh, I've been, no, yours is not, but you're part of it. And at the end of the day, I will not, and I hope that our public will not be hoodwinked and bamboozled about what's really going on. No one ever talks about all the great things that are coming out of this district. Everyone wants to, yes. negativity breeds hatred. Mm -hmm. Hatred breeds dislike. How do we come together and work for the betterment of the students and stop pointing fingers as though we have board members here or we have administrators here that are taking? That is so unfair. No one has taken anything. Everything is accounted for. It's in the book. But if all this food or whatever is <coughs> being purchased, but we don't know what it's for, then we don't know. Right. We don't. Okay. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe uh, I, I don't know. What's your name, sir? I'm sorry, Mr. Cedric. I know that you're new, but I've been around boards of education for a long time. I don't know many boards of education say we spent six thousand dollars. Tom Jones ate, Mary Lou ate, Sue Jane ate. This is what they ate. They give you and help me up a room. You have to be afraid. I, I just haven't seen that. But if that satisfy a board member or her community constituents, then maybe we we should do that. I don't know what that would change. You still spend six thousand dollars. Yes, Brandy, let, let me repeat for me. So, again, good evening. Um, board members, I, gosh, hate to talk about my track around the country and everywhere that I've been. I heard all about it. Listen, you good, good guy. Thank you. Um, what, what you're requesting, board member, while I'm not going to say it's wrong. It's a little irregular to provide, because uh, we, we receive an invoice. Uh, we don't receive a roster from a building saying, here's who all we fed, et cetera. So, I'm not asking who sat down and ate. I'm questioning $6,000. Um, when we say as a district, and we've said this many times, and we've all said it, and Dr. Henderson has said it, we talk about the importance of spending every taxpayer dollar for the benefit of our students. We talk about that constantly and being good custodians of this money and where the money is. I'm not asking you for a roster, so just, come on, don't get drawn into that nonsense. Is, is it really about taxpayer money? I am asking if we're no, spending money on food and some things are denoted as arena day or uh, test incentives for students or things like that, why aren't they all? Because that, and I hope you would agree with this, does contribute to transparency and accountability. If we can note what one purchase is and it's for arena day, why can't we note the other purchases? So I, I can actually answer your question. So when a requisition is entered into infinite visions, uh, depending on what the end user puts in as a description, that's what pulls in to the payables list. In some instances, we have the ability to manipulate it. In some instances, we don't have the information to manipulate what the activity was. But it really boils down to end user input. What they put into the requisite as a requisition is what turns into the PO, is what pulls in to your payable system. Right, so requisitions or invoices are being given to you without any notation as to what it was for. Let me, let me clarify. The requisition is the request from an end user to spend the board budget. So requisition starts at the end building. School puts in a requisition and says we're going to McDonald's. They don't say we're going to McDonald's for any activity. They just say we want to go to McDonald's. And it's a given that it's for students because we made it clear to faculty that they can't spend board money to feed themselves. 
So they say they put in a requisition that says McDonald's. The requisition is turned into a purchase order. Mm -hmm. We receive the bill, put the bill in for payment, and the bill that says McDonald's is what shows up on your payables. The finance department does not control that. It really stems from the end user and what they input to the requisition that turns into the purchase order that eventually lands in your payables. Right. Look at me. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not going to argue it, but I'm yeah, telling you I, I why would, I'm not voting for let me, this Let me tell you about those 6,000 dollars. I was there at the graduation. I was there mm -hmm. at the graduation. I got there at 7.30 in the morning, mm -hmm. and I was there to 6.30 at night. Mm -hmm. I ate breakfast, and I ate lunch there. I ate the same breakfast and the same lunch because it was breakfast food. So even if you, they said you take 40 people and you divide that by 6,000, it's 100. It's seventy-five dollars per person. Thirty-five dollars for breakfast downtown, delivered to you, and thirty-five dollars for lunch. Okay, let's say it's twenty people. That's one hundred and fifty dollars. That's seventy-five dollars for breakfast, bringing you the food to the place, and then bringing you the lunch to the place. Thank you. So I was there. If you do it this way, it doesn't sound like a lot of money. It was the board members, administrators, and another other people that were there during the whole day. We were the whole there the whole day. The board members. But some of the teachers from the first school were there in the morning, then second school in the afternoon, and it was the last school in the evening. Man, so, I mean, it looks like a lot of money. Look at what you're eating. We were there. That's what we, that's what we did. $30 per person for breakfast, for lunch. That's what it was. Can I give another example? We have credit cards. We have corporate MasterCard. Last month it was eighty three thousand five hundred. No That's itemization. That's all flooded. Um, or, or so if there's no itemization to large expenses, it's yeah. difficult for us to yeah, understand. Let's that we're that we're, ad, that we're ad, ad, um, giving that amount of money to because right. we have no understanding like that this board has agreed as to how that uh, Mastercard bill will take place, how you will receive it. I don't know why whenever you decide to come to the meetings that you make this attempt to make like something is wrong. Rodney, you get, Amanda, were you done? You got another question? I have no question. Okay, Rodney, were you? you yeah, I, I, I just wanted to say, Madam President, for the record, yeah, I, I mean, it's beyond grandstanding. It, it, it's, and, and Amanda, I, I, I try to respect and understand where you're coming from. But as Madam President said, we have three to four days after we get this book to be able to answer these questions intelligently to the community and to sit up here and act like you can't get that information is disingenuous. It's not that you don't understand. Ignorance is not not knowing. Ignorance is not wanting to know. And we all have access. Madam President, it's the text to all of us to say, if you have any questions about the board book, please get them to Dr. Henderson in a timely manner so we can answer them. Every one of your questions can be answered. But to get up here and act like they can't is what I have an issue with. I understand your concern, it's valid. But the way that you're practicing it is not. So I should ask for accountability and transparency in private? No, you should be able to ask and answer your questions and be able to vote with a clear conscience, knowing that we are transparent once you get the answer, ma'am. And be able to communicate that to your constituents when Listen, you get I'm the not, answer. Madam President, I'm not here to Are you going to include all board members Excuse on this me, I have the floor, I have the floor, ma'am. I'm, I'm, I'm not here to, I'm not here to. I have the floor. I'm not here to tell anybody how to be a board member. You, you got elected just like I do. Do what you will. Dr. Henderson, I want to thank you for the administration. You just told us once again that you saved us $1.4 million for the next four years, and she's talking about a McDonald's bill. This is what I'm talking about. We have the, we have the, I, I have this audit with me in public every meeting. This is our last audit that most folks have not even read. I've looked through all of it. We have a 3.9 rating by an independent auditor in the state of Illinois, and she's talking about McDonald's. Listen, we have to stop this. The facts are the facts. You can't sit up here and proceed like we're doing something wrong when we've got these documents from people that says we're not. The man just said we're saving 1.4 million a year on an eight period day that we thought was gonna cost us at least that. And then we have board members not wanting to vote on the board of the bill that's because of a McDonald's bill, a Jewel's bill. Really? Are we that petty? And if we are that petty, it's not affecting our bottom line. I say have at it, Dr. Henderson. Do your thing. 
Are there feed any? our students, yeah. feed our staff, be responsible like you've been for two years, and keep rising our, our, our financial status as we've done. It's just disingenuous that we have to continuously go through this every month because people don't choose to exercise their ability to get the right information. I yield back to President. Do you have a question, Claudia? Yeah. Um, would it be possible to have this list it's at the end of the bill list, Mr. Cedric, now that you're here? Every single thing is itemized individual. The list that we usually get from the treasurer's office, which is included, has, usually has all the individual um, um, expenditures. And this used to be a list that we got in totals from each one of the different vendors. So we could go through and check them afterwards in the bill list. Would it be possible for us to go back to totals? It may get so much easier so we know like what is the sum total that we're paying to Menda. So Menda is just um, put down one so we know the sum total. We know the sum total that we're sending to uh, per student. We know the sum total to environmental aims. Um, so this was supposed to be a, a list that we had for total so we knew what we were paying um, our contractors. Would it be possible to do that again? Oh, that's what that was. Yeah, it's not, it's individual. It's, 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 exactly it's a exactly. list exactly. of every single one of these, but it, you could have like 25 payments to, I don't know, commercial specialties. And then like he, here it's listed that, you know, um, for dirt, even though there's like 10 payments to, and this is not accurate, to Gordon Foods for $364, let's say. To just put, you know, three thousand dollars to Gordon Foods, just Gordon Foods, just one line item. So we know what's the sum total that we're sending to each one of. Them. That's how we used to do it. Okay, we need to make that a lot easier. Uh, I'd be greatly appreciate if we could have that list. Thank you. You you do say that every month. Um, let's move on. Call the roll. So this for the bill list, um, Mr. Alexander. Aye. Ms. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Medina? Nay. Ms. Grant? Nay. Ms. Patterson? Aye. Ms. Valtieres? Aye. Ms. Wagner? Aye. Motion carries. That was 12 on right? That was 12 on um, BP. <laughs> 12 eyes, thanks. 12 aye. Discussion? I can hear you. Oh, I mean, motion, more, sorry. So moved. Yeah. Motion to approve 12 aye. So moved. Second. Discussion. Um, my concern with this item is that um, on the agenda it's listed as dorm code, but on the action item there's no specific vendor listed. Um, and it doesn't talk about what we would be getting for this $48,000. I also feel like this expense, well, um, generous and would certainly win people some points with families is really not um, not in good taste. I don't feel it's something that we can keep up year after year. If we're going to do it one year, we need to do it all years. But this is for students who have already graduated. This is sending money out of the district on students who have already graduated. We fulfilled, you know, kind of our, our duty to those students. We need to focus this $48,000 on the students who are here. Um, also, it seems like we're going specifically against our policy. Um, all contracts for supplies, materials, or work involving expenditure in excess of $25,000 shall be made in accordance with applicable federal and state laws bid and bidding procedures unless it's specifically exempted. Um, if these are supplies for students, even though they aren't our students anymore, there should still be some kind of bidding process or at least three comparable quotes. There aren't. And truthfully, the way this action item is written, we could give $48,000 to anyone who said they were going to, uh, quote, provide uh, complete trunk college essentials for 130 people. It comes out to 369 and change per student. But if the actual vendor isn't in here, there's no way of knowing where this money is being directed. And that's in complete contrast to other items we have um, that we've already voted on. For example, the college board suite of assessments. Um, it's very clear about what you're getting for every single component, and not only is it written out, we're also given a sample bill, of, so we know exactly what we are paying for and who we're paying this money to. None of that is included with this action item. Madam President, discussion. Discussion? Yeah, I, I think, um, Amanda, I, I finally agree with you on something. I saw that also. It would have been nice if, um, you know, in all of the things that I was doing, 
that, you know, not only do I trust the superintendent and the administrative staff, I didn't find that it was that egregious or that serious, but it would have been also nice if you had been able to get that information from Doc so that he could have provided it at this time rather than making it another speculation. Uh, once again, Doc, if it's at all possible, can you get us the information for the public uh, so that we can have that information in detail that she's requesting? Yes, sir. That's yes. done. So that's an, a very easy thing that possibly could have been done days ago if you had just brought it up. And I saw that, but I didn't have time and didn't write it down. But it's just that easy. We can get that information rather than making it into an accusation. Thank you, Dr. Henderson. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, so this is the action I'm for I to uh, give $369 to these 130 students that just graduated from college, correct? That's correct. Maybe a laptop or an iPad or, or I don't know, book bag books? Yes, yeah. that's fine. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Discussion. Okay. Um, for several other high schools, um, at this, um, at the time of graduation, what has been done um, is that we provide or you know, schools provide a gift card so the students can utilize the money for what they need because oftentimes what's provided in these trunks are for things that the students don't need and um, they could use the money towards food that week or for whatever it is that they may need and that way it can be allocated. So gift cards are usually what is, um, is given to students, especially for that huge amount of money could equally be given out portion in gift cards. Students can use it for what they need. If it, they need to buy a computer, if they need whatever it is that they need to use, then it can be you know, allocated to their needs. I think that this is a wasteful. Okay. I, I feel that uh, this would be a good gesture uh, to help our students. Uh, this, they are coming out of a pandemic and I think it would be good uh, for the school to supply them a, a trunk and the supplies for their dorm, for their dorm, for the uh, first year of school, which, you, you, which would include, if you know anything about, about it, it would include your, your sheet, um, pillow, a pillow, uh, towels, and all your uh, necessities uh, that you would use the first year away from school, uh, from, excuse me, away from home. I think that it would be really, it would really help our parents out uh, some of our parents need the help, and these, these students need help. So this is what a lot of schools are doing. They're having, and they call them a trunk party. And that's exactly what they are. You're getting a trunk, and you're getting your necessity items, the essential items that you will need your first year of college. And I think that that's a great idea. We did give computers one year to all seniors. So, uh, same difference. We're giving instead to 130 scholars. Uh, we're helping their parents and helping them with supplies to supply them for a whole year of their first year away from home. I think it's, I think it's excellent. Madam President, discussion real quick. Nearly 60% of our scholars have been identified as low income with the loss of jobs and other financial hardships due to the national pandemic. Our Board of Education members will make use of some Board of Education scholarship funds to assist families with the initial college costs of students attending school at least 150 miles away. Dr. Henderson, based upon the way that this action item is worded, these monies are coming out of the Board of Education scholarship funds, which we raise throughout the year through different donations, correct? Most of that, yes. Okay. So most of this money is not coming out of the educational fund. Most of it is being raised and given away as a gift by the Board of Education. I understand that some people believe that our job and role as educators and board stops when our students graduate. I beg to differ. In a community, it never stops. We're always responsible for our students, and when they have a need, they should be able to come back to their institutions and have that need fulfilled. Within certain communities, that's the way it should work. We should never wash our hands of our community members when 60% of them are low income, and we have a budget, and we've managed their money, their money uh, responsibly, and we can assist them going to further their education. So on the one hand, we want accountability for our students, but on the other hand, we don't want to give them anything once they're not our students. I don't understand. They're not community anymore. They're no longer our responsibility once they graduate. But we care so much about how much they eat at McDonald's when they're with us. We have to stop being hypocrites in our message. We have a responsibility as a community that never ends as it relates to the education and support of our students, especially, as Ms. Kelly said, that all-important first year 
of their educational process where money and the being away from home is so traumatic it can be so stressful on a family and you're going to say we shouldn't do anything that's too much money for our students well, oh school. i'm sorry they're not our students anymore i yield back but they've been here for four years i know, um, I know. whatever let me just say that it saddens my heart to hear the word used is wasteful our young people are dying every day yeah. every day Either by taking their lives, being shot and killed, dealing with traumatic uh, injuries. Anybody that know me, I'm for academic achievement and student learning. All this other baloney that go on, I, I could really care less. ago I involved a kid that was 17 years old that had been shot and killed on the west side of Chicago. Academically intelligent, high performer. He was in the right place but at the wrong time. Because I hate when I hear it was in the wrong place at the wrong time. No, he was where he was supposed to be. Because this is a free world. We should be able to be wherever we want. But when I hear adults say things like waste because we're using money to help somebody's child that need it that's a problem for me waste because we are saying hey let's look out for our scholars because at the end of the day I just heard something about our tax dollars <coughs> where their parents live here and pay taxes just because they go off to school doesn't mean they're no longer part of the community. That's right. So let the record reflect, there is no waste. They can have every dime we got in this district when it comes to kids or young people. Waste, call the roll. Get parts. Mr. Alexander? Aye. Ms. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Medina? Nay. Thank you. Ms. Grant? Nay. Thank you. Ms. Patterson? Aye. Ms. Valteris? Aye. Ms. Wagner? Aye. Motion carries. We have a motion to approve 12J. So moved. Second. Um, discussion? Discussion. Yeah, I just want to point out to the public that what is in the board book is not exactly what is being um, voted on tonight. We received during the executive session an amended personnel report that includes um, sections A, the PTU union employment, um, operations, oh sorry, B, special payroll, C, operations and maintenance union, uh, part two, retirement, part three, resignations, and part four approved leaves. It does not include uh, part um, the part about other employment, which would be all the coaching positions. Those were taken off. So just know that when we're voting, we are not voting on any of the coaching positions that were listed in that personal report. That's and just for the public to know, we have requested criteria for uh, the coaching stipends so we can understand the disparity in, in some of the coaching stipends and um, ensure that we have equity in all of our student allocations. Discussion. April 2022, I was elected president of the Board of Education. My intent <laughs> was to talk about that being pulled, but since um, I had a great assistance from Ms. Uh, Grant and Ms. Medina, um, they have pretty much said what I was going to say in reference to us having amended. Uh, see, you don't have to respect me, but please respect the seat. There was an amendment. I was not afforded an opportunity to tell you about the amendment. Is there any other discussion? Yes. 
Um, the um, personnel report does not reflect any experience or tell us any, um, from any one of the people that are here or tell us where they, um, they, they came from or where they had the experience. Um, with that lack of knowledge and the fact that um, it has not been provided to us, I don't feel that um, it is adequate for us to be able to vote on this. We have more than enough information. Um, we no, that's my opinion have, as a board member. Thank you. We actually have people in place uh, administratively uh, that we pay thousands of dollars to. That is, that is the hundreds of thousands of things mm -hmm. that we that are well able to interview and choose uh, the best candidate for a position. To say that John John worked at Manly High School 10 years and South Shore 8 years and Chicago Vocational 10 years, that does nothing. If you just say they worked 21 years in education, that's more than enough because you very well can't go get on the phone and call and say, I'm Mrs. So-and-so and so and i want to know how well they did at your district. I mean, I don't understand, this is every month, uh, that this, this same question, I want to know where they work, how long they work. Um, we have people in place. People, I, public, I want you to understand, the Board of Education role and responsibility is to set policy. It is the superintendent's job to implement policies that have been set. It is not our job to say who will be, we, we do the hiring and fire, but everything is predicated on the recommendation of the superintendent. Are, is there any more discussion? Uh, 12J. I have to call 12J5, uh, I wanted to put in that separately. Mm -hmm. You want to pull a weapon? 12J5. 12J5. On top of 12J. Okay. okay but we haven't voted on 12J. We haven't voted on 12J. Okay, so are we, are we, we just, we're just getting rid of the, because there's a motion on the floor to vote on the entire personnel report. Right. So you want to pull a 12J5? Yeah, I want to pull 12J5. Okay, so then we need to separate it. I need to pull a 12J5. Okay, so we need to separate it. Okay, so we need to I think I need a motion then, I tell you. Yeah, yeah, let me make a motion. I'm going to do this. Okay, so I'll make a I'd like to amend my motion to allow the board president to pull 12J5 out of 12J before we vote for 12J in vote. Second, I'm amending my motion to uh, vote separately on 12J to include voting separately on 12J5 separate from 12J. 12J5. 12J5. Okay. Okay, so, then, so we could vote on 12J. We could vote on 12J, and then we'll vote on 12J5. Right. We'll and part one, you're talking about. Everything 12J is set five. Yes. And in part one, section A. All the roll. Any exception of 12J5. You're talking about Roman numeral five. Right. Roman numeral five? Number five. One, the number five. Oh, one, the number five. Yeah, okay, five. Here we go. A, A one, one A five. Mm -hmm. okay. J one, A, A, one five. Yeah, A, A five. Okay. One, A five. We're going to call on 12J. Right, calling the roll on 12J. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Alexander? Aye. Ms. Kelly? Aye. Patterson? Except. I'm sorry. Except for five, number five. Oh, we just didn't. No. Okay, everything else, answer. yes. Okay. Ms. Medina? Nay. Ms. Grant? Abstain. Mr. Belteris? Aye. Mr. Wagner? Aye. Motion to pay. Good. 1A, 12J5, number five, A5. So moved. Second. Mr. Alexander? Aye. Ms. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Patterson? Nay. Ms. 
Convener? Abstain. Ms. Grant? Abstain. Mr. Valtieros, abstain. Ms. Wagner? Aye. Motion failed. Motion carried. 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 Motion carried.
I'd like us to consider um, finding a way, since we have our own food program, to uh, provide some type of food for the athletes. The, our teams, our kids on the teams are getting really, really hungry. It's, um, some of them have lunches at 10 in the morning, and they, they're, they're, there's not enough food for them. So if we, we could do something to try and figure out for all of the sports, for us to do something, it would, I think the, the, the kids would really appreciate it. Thanks. Madam President, uh, go, go ahead. My, 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 my slides, yeah, with, the, the, the teams eat after every practice, so I don't know what teams or what students are, but they're already doing that. And thank you, Dr. Henderson and the cafeteria staff for making sure that our athletes eat. As a matter of fact, they eat every day at summer camp. So I'm not sure what it is that you're talking about, Ms. Medina. They already do that. We've been doing that consistently for the last year. Uh, making sure that the sports teams have food. And I want to thank the pack of geese that came out Saturday for the picnic and even made sure that they barbecued specifically for the marching band so that they didn't have to attend. So our parents and our community, as well as the administration, are already doing what you're requesting. So that, that's already been done. The students, um, that's, student athletes have come to talk to me, so I'm letting you know that okay, there, are, some, there are children that are hungry okay. and there are parents that are concerned. I know. There are some great packs that have been wonderful things, but it's not right. collectively for everything. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, Madam President, I hate to let new business work. Go ahead. Okay. And, 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 and so this is for you and, the, and, and Mr. Davis. I would really like to see moving forward. And I'm glad that we did pull the athletic uh, coaches list. Listen, um, we're asking for accountability across the board. And I believe uh, as board members, when we speak to the public, we should also make sure that we're, we're checking those boxes. We've got a lot of coaches down here um, getting stipends. And I would really like to see a presentation from both athletic directors moving forward before we approve other employment in the future. I want to see what the records were last year. I want to see where we're ranked in the conference. I want to see what the plans are to improve student performance and scholarship opportunities. I want the public to see that as we give out these monies for stipends to some of these coaches year after year after year, we're losing records, justification for why we're bringing them back. Okay, so if we're going to have accountability across the board, we've got to have accountability and stop just putting these in the book and just fail school saying they're approved and Nobody's been downstate and no one has won and no one's been properly trained. There's no accountability. We want better. We have to do better. So moving forward, if it pleases the board, we can direct Dr. Henderson to make sure that we get a full, the community gets a full-blown presentation and explanation, even if we have to post it, email it, it's too long to get in the presentation form. Where are the girls of track? Where is the rest of it? Where are we ranked in the state? And how long have we been ranked? And what are the plans of these coaches to improve that? Rather than just giving stipends to the coaches that may not have the quality or ability to coach, and they've been there for years, and we ain't gone to where we're not doing our, our kids a service. So just that for new business moving forward, just some accountability as it relates to these coaches, and making sure that the community knows that they can look forward to some improvements in the athletic department also. Uh, okay, is, are you saying, where do you, when do you want that? When if that it pleases the board, okay, exactly. I'm, I'm just I'm making a suggestion, but if it pleases the board, I would like for us to do that straight away before we approve any coaches this year. I don't believe we just came out of a, a, we're going through contracts and we're trying to create some change in the district. That should be across the board. We shouldn't be doing anything like we did it last year. That means we shouldn't be approving sports. We shouldn't be doing anything like we did it last year, and I'm talking about accountability for this board too. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to sit up here and just fail, swoop, approve a bunch of coaches and there's no accountability. We don't know anything about these sports. The community needs to know that information. I don't think it's hard for us to produce that docs. Really, okay. they'll figure out a way to get that information to the community and to the board so that we can make better educated decisions as it relates to who we're allowing to coach our students. Okay, we all want to win, of course, but it isn't all winning. Uh, we have, uh, we, it, 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 it's making these students better, uh, both academic, uh, to perform academically. Uh, a lot of kids depend on the sport, so, and, and they will keep their grades up so that they are eligible to play. Uh, however, it's not all about winning, but we have not, we have to have the things in place first before we can demand, make these demands of coaches. We have to have playing time allotted to these coaches. 
where they could get in and have gym time at a certain time. Um, so those are some of the things that we have to do. Right now, we just started a camp. This is the first time Proviso has had a summer camp. So you can't just say, okay, well, let's go on now and do this, this, and this, and see who's winning. We have to help them and, get, and make them successful. We have to give them, the, the coaches, the tools in which to be successful. So I think that maybe if you want to do that a couple of years from now, after we have had, the coaches have had gym time, they know their schedule, their schedule and they're allotted in these gyms, and we're not going picking out coaches uh, and giving them uh, their coaching uh, uh, program in August, which we will be doing. You know, it's too late. We, I mean, we have coaches in Chicago. They coach all year round. They don't stop. So, you know, that, it's not fair to the coaches. Well, I wish we could talk more. I wish we could talk about that if it was cheap and stupid learning and we could talk about coaches. We can. Madam we President. do. Madam President. Yes, sir. Um, I think I, I agree with you, Ms. Kelly, and all of those things need to be worked out by our athletic directors so that we can have a plan to move forward. I don't think well, it's not now. Yeah, I think it needs to happen. It needs to happen immediately. They can't be successful. Well, now. I mean, they haven't been successful in that. Well, they, they haven't been. So, when are they going to start, and why do we have to wait years for that to start when they when when they're given the tools in which to be okay. successful? If it, if it pleases the board, I'm not going to argue. If it pleases the board, yeah. Dr. Henderson, no, if it pleases I, I the board, no. then that's fine. I say no. Um, we can direct Dr. Henderson in that vein, but I, I'm saying we need to stop giving out stipends to coaches that have been here for this many years and haven't produced anything academically or otherwise. So if they and are, if they are, and the athletic directors can bring us that information, then they are. I'm not saying they're not. I'm saying we don't know right now. Okay. So and we, we before we vote, we, we, we need to know, know. who's getting our students, who, what their grades are, how they're doing <laughs> academically, what their behavior are, these kids getting suspended and being on the team. We need to know that information. I think that's a great idea, but I don't know if it's realistic to do that. Okay. Miss Kelly, where are you at with that? What? With, with, with you all, you were right here discussing. I'm saying no, it's not no. the time. We don't okay. have where are you at? 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 Where are you Okay, move on. Please. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So move. Second. Mr. Alexander? Aye. Ms. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Medina? Patterson? Aye. Ms. Grant? Aye. Ms. Wagner? Aye. Motion carries. Adjourn.